Hello, everyone, and welcome back to another edition of Mormon Stories Podcast. I'm your host, John DeLynn. It's September 22nd, 2020. And today we have something uh, different, something fun, I think something entertaining, and a uh, little bit of sugar to help the medicine go down, so to speak. Uh, today we have on Mormon Stories, Mitch Shira. Is that how I pronounce it, Mitch? That's correct, Mitch Shira. And you may, uh, you may recognize Mitch's face. Uh, Mitch is is taking the progressive and post Mormon uh, internet world by storm. He has produced a series of TikTok videos uh, that impersonate uh, various LDS Church prophets, <laughs> and uh, they're super funny and they're a little bit uh, sharp edged. Sometimes they're unsavory, a little bit. Uh, blue or uh, brass, I don't, brash, I don't know exactly how to characterize it, but they're always funny and they're always very effective and they always pack an important punch, pack a powerful punch. There's some alliteration. Um, I do want to give just a quick content warning. Uh, Mitch deals with uh, serious adult topics, including matters of sexuality. And so uh, there's kind of an adult content warning to this audio and video, if you are sensitive to those sorts of things, if you can't wrap your brain around this idea that, that lives are at stake, that, that the way the church teaches issues around sexuality, for example, really do impact lives. Um, and sometimes in a very serious or fatal way, thus, you know, uh, thus sometimes the, the language needs to be serious. If, if you are not cool with that, uh, turn it off now. Um, but th these impressions are phenomenal. So find a way to, to them anyway. He's known as Genie Man on TikTok. Genie, G-E-N-I-E -E underscore man on TikTok. Um, also, there's sort of a orthodoxy warning, I'll say. If you are sensitive to your prophets, seers, and revelators being impersonated, uh, if you feel like that's sacrilegious, if your interpretation of your temple covenants Make it so that you are not comfortable with loud laughter or evil speaking of the Lord's anointed. You may or may not decide that this interview is for you. We're going to try and keep it fun and light, but we're also going to be dealing, dealing with serious serious topics. But uh, is that a, is that enough disclaimer, uh, Mitch? Or do you want to yeah, add something? Yeah, I think so. I think that's perfect. I think it's a great disclaimer. <laughs> a great way to start. <laughs> All right. So uh, I'm going to start off, Mitch, with one of you. Well, first of all, I want to welcome our viewing audience. Uh, we are live streaming this on Facebook and on YouTube, and we really want to uh, welcome uh, comments and questions. Mitch, you can see those questions, right? I can't. So Okay. I well, I, all right. Well, I'll have to read them for you. But um, all right, perfect. My, <laughs> listeners and viewers, if you are interested, please do share your questions and comments on social media, and we'd love to incorporate them. And uh, so without any further ado, should we show one of your videos, Mitch? Let's do it. All right. All right, guys. And uh, TikTok works funny on the desktop. So I have to go to the window and refresh it because it doesn't have a pause button. So if you hear a sound before the video starts, it's just me refreshing the browser. That's not so much a technical glitch as a, as a weird uh, function of TikTok on the desktop because TikTok is an app that you install on your phone and it lets you watch super short videos and it's a big deal. It's so big that Donald Trump wants to ban it and it takes a lot to get banned by Donald Trump, I would say. Is that fair to say? That is fair to say. A lot of us had a scare there when the, on Sunday, but you know, I was one of the ones that thought that it was just another scare tactic. So, and it's, here, it's still here. So, so we're going to be interviewing Mitch throughout this interview. Obviously, we'll be showing a few of his videos, and then maybe he'll b bust out a spontaneous impression, and we'll just have some fun with this. So, just to introduce you guys to Mitch, uh, here's a first video. Sisters. All right, here we go. My dear beloved brothers and sisters. It is with a heavy heart that I come to you today. <clears throat> Excuse me. I come to you now with all open-mindedness and an open heart 
to tell you the truth of the so-called self-proclaimed prophet of the Lord, even Joseph Smith himself. I declare openly, this man was a fraud. He married other men's wives, took children to wife, practiced in a, pra <coughs> excuse me, practice an abominable <coughs> practice. All right. <laughs> All right, Mitch. So that's beautiful. That's uh, that's that's <laughs> Mitch Shira as Genie Man on TikTok impersonating none other than the beloved Gordon B. Hinckley. Mitch, welcome to Mormon Stories Podcast. Thank you. Thanks for having me, John. It's a pleasure. I feel so honored. All right. Well, let's just, uh, let's dig in a bit with your story. Tell us, tell us about your early Mormon years and uh, lead us to the point where you would ever decide to create a TikTok channel like this. Let's get started. <laughs> All right. Well, uh, I was born and raised in the church, born in the covenant. Um, Born in 1987 and very, very religious family. I had a um, very typical uh, Mormon family. I have eight brothers, uh, no sisters. Um, and my whole life, my entire uh, life was watching General Conference. My my dad and mom were of the, of the rule that we always sit down from the age that I can remember. I, gosh, it was... Even when I was three, I can just remember I would be outside playing on Saturday and my dad and mom would come out and be like, general conference is on, get in here. And we would sit through every session. And so I think that contributes to a lot of, a lot of my impressions and I've had years to watch them. But uh, yeah, I, I guess a lot of my, I was a lot of times when as I grew in the church, I was one of the ones that was completely invested. And I had a huge, huge desire um, to find the truth and to follow the spirit. Um, from an age I can remember, once I knew about missionary work, I was stoked and ready to go. Um, I looked forward to it. So I was, I never, I never regretted or, or I guess uh, held any, discourse about going on a mission. It was, it was something that I always, always wanted to do. Tell us again, um, what town, tell us what town kind of you grew up in? Uh, I'm born and raised in Utah. Um, I grew up mainly in Linden, which is uh, right by Orem and, and uh, Utah Valley. Um, what, did, I also, uh, what did, what did your parents, what, if you're able to share and you can say yeah. out anything you don't want to share, what did your parents do for work? Uh, so my dad is, uh, a filmmaker. He's an independent filmmaker. Nice. And my, and my mom at the time was a stay-at-home parent. Um, now she works as a in the government as a um, a, health, a health worker, I believe. Um, and uh, but that was before they they're now unfortunately divorced. Uh, but which is part of uh, my journey. But, but yeah, I grew up there um, when they did. How many How many siblings? Uh, eight. Eight brothers. Whoa, that's a what? Yeah. Are you the of, are you one of the eight or are there nine total? Uh there's nine. I'm, there are I'm, nine brothers in your family? Nine nine boys all together, no girls. So any adoptions or or blended families or any of that? Nope. Uh all all natural. <laughs> what the oh my god, I gotta meet your mother. Yeah, she is she's my hero. She's honestly, um, an amazing, the most amazing woman alive. She's, she's been through a lot. So seven um, brothers, they say seven brides for seven brothers, nine <laughs> brothers, nine brothers. Yeah. Nine, nine, nine boys. And, uh, and where are you in the birth order? I'm number four. Okay. That's uh wow. And you say li mostly Linden, is that what you said? Most, yeah, correct. Mostly Linden. Um, and Linden's kind of like North of Provo, right? Yes, it's north of Provo. It's it's right south of Pleasant Grove. Mm -hmm. South Ple Pleasant Grove, uh, about 35, 45 minutes from Salt Lake City. My my uh, my one visit to Linden uh, when I was in at BYU, Ty Detmer, the Heisman Trophy winning uh -huh. quarterback, yeah, uh, got baptized at a at a chapel in Linden. So I I drove to oh, wow. Linden to watch Ty Detmer get baptized. That's my 
That's my one association with Linden. <laughs> uh, you know, it's actually a really nice, quaint little town. Um, it's growing a lot, just like a lot of Utah County. But, but yeah, um, lived there. Uh, you, had, most, you had mentioned uh, your parents got divorced. At what age were you? I was around twelve when they separated. Oh wow! Right in those middle school mm -hmm. years. That's that's about the same yeah. age I was. I was when my parents got divorced. Yeah, it's it's tough. It was it was a tough experience. Um, Bef before the divorce, how traditional mm -hmm. was your Mormon family? Uh, extremely traditional. Very very um, to the book, I would say. Um, every it, it, we were one of those families that if you we'd always do always always my dad would always sit us down for personal scripture or family scripture study and prayer um and we'd make sure we stayed awake because at the end of the day as kids we would be so tired and dozing off and he would make sure that we were staying awake so that we would listen and uh we'd have family prayer every single night family home evening every monday um he and mom went on temple dates weekly. And so it was, it was a very, very traditional uh, Mormon family. And quite honestly, uh, I a lot of cherished memories, although even though now at later in life, as I've went on my journey and, and discovered for myself that uh, I don't affiliate with those beliefs, um, you know, the, the, the things that I do take away from religion, um, the Mormon religion, is that uh, there's structure? <laughs> there's some good structure for kids. Did um, you did you do the the Cub Scouts and and all that stuff? And all of it, yeah. The Cub Scouts uh, every, I mean, it would fluctuate every Tuesday or Wednesday, sometimes Thursday. Went on the campouts and made a lot of friends. Uh, and so, yeah, we were we were a traditional Mormon family, and and I mean, I can I bet you can imagine just the Shiras walking in. <laughs> nine boys coming in through the door and finding a pew in the in sacrament meeting big enough to sit down and so and we were always late mormon standard time always 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 well with nine boys you get a medal just for showing up um <laughs> do, do you um was it was the divorce a surprise to you as a 12 year old mormon kid did, did you anticipate it was it just a total blindside it it was and that's part of the it i would always because even even as a young, uh, e even being so young, the Mormon Church and its teachings made a, a great, a, you know, a very distinct impression on my mind that families were extremely important and that they were eternal. And I think I knew subconsciously seeing some problems. Um, now that I look back, I would see some problems in in with my mom and dad. Um, and so I, I, I even remember asking my dad, um, hey, you guys are never going to get divorced, right? That's never going to happen. And so I think I knew that they were something was coming up, but I he, he would always say, no, no, we're together forever. We're always going to be here. And so when it did happen, um, it blindsided me in a way that I, it, I, I think it shattered my dreams of like the eternal marriage of like, what the, these guys you're supposed to stay together forever and uh and yeah it, it was it was i guess an understatement could you could say it was very blindsided it's i just have to say i i had that same conversation with my with my dad i asked my dad are you guys ever going to get divorced and of course he said no never mm -hmm. happen. i i remember kids kids kind of know kids kind of feel yeah. it right they do they do and uh and that's the point where my dad is originally from northern Idaho, clear up in the Panhandle, in a very small town called Kuski. He moved there, and my family split. So a lot of my brothers, I think four of them, eventually went with my dad. And I, me, and uh, I think uh, five younger, not four younger, uh, stayed with my mom. Oh wow! So it it split the family, the whole family, and it was it was a pretty uh, pretty devastating split. Um, it split the pretty, brothers up. Yeah, it split split the brothers up, and not in the way of like we were so young. A lot of us were so young that we just you know at that point it was just like I want to be with dad, I want to be with mom, and so um, and I remember thinking 
because I we I, I went to Idaho too to visit, and at that point there were some of my older brothers um, staying up there, uh, wanting to live with my dad, and it was kind of uh, more, for lack of a better word, a trend. In my they were they were trying a lot of my brothers were doing it and they felt they needed to be up there. Um, and so I, I would, I remember being faced with this dilemma. I was like, well, of course I love dad. I love him with all my heart, but, but everyone's leaving mom and I, uh, I don't want her to be alone. And I just remember thinking that and going, oh, I need to get back to mom and help her out. And so I went back to Utah um, stayed a couple of years there. Um, and that was challenging. Uh, it honestly was to, to, to go from a perfect Mormon family to completely. And I'm, and, and for me personally, yes, but I can't imagine what my mom and dad went through the view of the, I guess the cultural view and, and the doctrinal view of the Mormon church one day walking in with nine boys all together eternally as a family perfect mormon family and then suddenly where's where's my dad where's where's uh half of the kids split family and my mom continued to go to church um she was very strong in the church just like my dad and so i just remember in junior high it was it was tough i was I, I I started suffering a little with my identity. I didn't know exactly who I was. Um, and I think that's common for a lot of uh, kids going through divorce. Um, but honestly, I, through all of that, I kept my core beliefs in the Mormon church. It's all I knew. I mean, I went to primary. I was, I went to Sunday school and a lot of my friends were there. And so, I kept some of those core beliefs with me, even though I was struggling. Um, so yeah, I, it, it was, it was an interesting time of my life. I, I, I just have to, I just wanted to say that I, I've heard, I, I, I love comedy. Um, mm -hmm. I, I've followed it from a young age uh, whenever I could. Uh, I've heard comedy described my, my parents. This is weird in the seventies. Our family would, uh, watch the Saturday night live as a family. And we were a Mormon family back then. And this was pre-divorce, but they, oh, yeah. my parents would let me stay up late and watch Saturday night live. And this was Bill Murray and Jane Curtin, you know, um, <laughs> yeah. Radner, Garrett Morris, you know, Chevy chase, mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. John Belushi. And, and uh, comedy was a really, you know, even the Donnie Marie show had a lot of comedy. We watched mm -hmm. that as, as kids as well. So I, but 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 the reason I'm mentioning all that is because I've heard comedy described as pain plus time. I don't know if you've heard that before. Have you heard that description? Uh, I don't think so. I don't think I've heard that one. Okay. Well, the, I, I guess what I'm saying is, is I'm hearing, you know, some some are going to probably say that your YouTube videos can be a little bit vicious or harsh. Mm -hmm. But yeah. my guess is the the level of harshness or directness or sharp elbowedness mm -hmm. connect to maybe a lot of this pain that you experienced starting oh, from a very young age I mean, having to see having to pick between your parents having to feel that disappointment having to worry about your mom as a kid when mm -hmm. your parents are supposed to be worrying about you that's a lot of pain yeah and 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 i i agree it's uh, a lot of and there have been, there have been, uh, I'm sure, well-intentioned members, uh, true, um, active members that that have commented, and I can see that they're offended, and um, and and so with me, a lot of when I when I do these videos, yes, there's a lot of pain, and and I think this is this is for everyone that not only goes through a faith transition. But any any kind of pain in your child in your childhood or your early uh, adulthood or even now, pain is is going to stay. It's part of life, and um, and the more we can appropriately, I would say, poke fun at it and and use that as laughter, 
it it heals it really does and and um and and so for as now as an ex mormon having left the church though i went through tremendous amounts and i still am going through tremendous amounts of pain and and quite frankly identity crisis because i built my entire life around those beliefs i built my entire life around those narratives and when i discovered and did my own research and started going on my own faith journey it was a huge blow and it 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 hurt and it still hurts and and so one of the reasons i do these these videos is for me i selfishly it's cathartic to to want to go hey what if what if these prophets actually spoke what they should speak? What if they actually address these concerns that the members themselves have that seem to be constantly put aside and just, no, let's just talk about these over here, or this over here. And it's kind of like a, um, a magic trick to be quite frank. It's like, don't look here, look here. And, and that's one of my biggest, biggest uh, letdowns. And so I was like, you know what? I've, uh, I've been, <laughs> I've been messing around with these impressions my whole life, and uh, why not start pretending that these men actually say, "Hey, you know what? You're right. That that was really crappy of us." Well, let's uh, let's show another one of your videos, and I think it'll be a good segue into your adolescent, teenage, and early adult years, uh, because because we all know that as a Mormon teen in Utah, <laughs> you you will have uh, been confronted with the dilemma of the little factory. So uh, yes. without any further ado, let's bring in uh, Boyd K. Packer. Is that okay? That's perfect. All right, here we go. Let me switch, switch screens really quick. And uh, here's Boyd K. Packer. Several years ago at the University of Brigham Young, I am ashamed to admit that we practiced things there that were not right. We viewed the homosexual as an abomination in the sight of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. There we tested them, also known as shock therapy, in which we would show them male pornography and if they became aroused, we would shock their genitals. On one occasion, I was viewing these circumstances and I became aroused myself. And so naturally I shocked my own penis. It was painful. So, um, <laughs> That is uh, Mitch Shira as Genie Man on TikTok. Uh, that that was a, that's a that's a heavy one. That's a serious one. It and, is. Um, and we tried to give some warnings at the beginning, but that uh, as as one of our listeners, Kimberly, noted that that video probably deserved definitely deserved a trigger warning. Um, yeah. may, maybe uh, when I go back and edit this for the audio, I can I can include that. But um, yeah. Mm -hmm. but you know, Boyd K Packer that first of all, uh, what a heavy topic. I'm like, I'm feeling the weight of that topic as someone yeah. who researched a lot of those issues, but I'm also feeling just, you know, hilarity as I see you impersonate Boyd K Packer, who is a, you know, an apostle who influenced all of our lives as, as, mm -hmm. as Mormons and as adolescents. Why don't we jump into your adolescence after the divorce and yeah. uh, talk about your your experiences as a as a teen and even a young adult and uh, let's just follow your timeline of your story. Yeah. Um, so after my parents' divorce and after I was living with my mom in Utah, I remember um, the first time that so. So to be, I guess, another trigger warning, to be completely honest, um, my, and I, I'm sure there are a lot of members like this, uh, ex-members and members alike, and that I, I had no idea what sex was. I had no idea. I, my, my mom and dad never talked about it. 
They never pulled me aside and said, hey, this is what sex is. This is its function with even within the Mormon church. Um, this is a funny story is when <laughs> I remember the only time my dad told me about anything even to do with sex or even masturbation was I remember I was in the bathtub. I was probably nine. I was in the bathtub and he came in um, to check on me and he was like, don't play with it. <laughs> and I had no idea what he was talking about. I just remember as a kid going, don't, don't play with it. Don't play with it. And so to me as a kid, that meant don't play with my genital as a toy. And that's what I thought he meant. He didn't give any background. He didn't give any context. And so up until I was 15, I remember hearing for the first time, I was with my older cousin, uh, one of my role models at that time. And I remember he had brought me with him, he and his friends, he was attending BYU and he knew that we had gone through a divorce. And so he, he had stepped in to try and help the kids and help my mom. And he took me to BYU one day. He was with his friends and they were, they were sharing stories about when their parents first told them what sex was. And they were going through and I was sitting there in the cafeteria. <laughs> and I just, I mean, if you can imagine a kid, a 15 year old, 14 year old, 15 year old kid eating and hearing for the first time that every detail of what sex, what's how to have sex or the parents telling their kids, okay, sit down. This is exactly how you have sex and this is its function. And my mind, would I, it felt like my mind melted. I had no idea. And I thought at up until the age of 15, I thought that you had, when you had babies, it's because you loved each other, plain and simple. And it's embarrassing <laughs> to admit now, looking back, but it, you know, it's going back to that video and, and Packer is, is not only Packer, but uh, is he's, he's notorious for talking about basically shaming sex in any form. And or masturbation or something that now to me sex you know it's it's a natural thing and looking back at the influence that my parents had and now the bigger picture in my mind is the stigma around sex in the LDS church um, you don't talk about it and I know it's it's changed a lot I know that there's change but back then I'm sure um, there are many who experience this, this, a similar experience. You just don't talk about it. You don't, it's hush hush. You don't talk about the bedroom. You don't talk about sex, sex. And if the, if you do talk about sex, sex is bad. Sex is bad. Um, and so as, as a teen, I remember being introduced to that, not in the right way. And I struggled a lot. I, str I didn't know. I mean, th this hit me like a ton of bricks, to be honest. I was like, what? The How come? And so I started to feel resentment. I was like, why? And, and I was, of course, living with my mom. And so unfortunately, I did take it out on her. I, I remember and I, and I was a soft spoken kid. Like, I, yeah, I was rambunctious. <laughs> I was a goofball. Um, but I, I didn't confront and so I would, I remember talking to my mom and being like, why, why didn't you guys tell me this is important? Like, this is, this isn't something I should be learning now. I should have, you should have been having this talk with me when I was 10, 11, 12. Um, if even, even if that's, that might even be too late. Um, and I think that contributes to a lot of, there, there are some, some issues. There are some sexual repressed issues within not only the Mormon church, but a lot of religious communities. And, and so even going in, going into 
Bishop's interviews. I mean, hell, they weren't even they weren't even blunt about it. They would tiptoe around it. As and and uh, I remember the first time I I didn't know what the heck he was talking about. The counselor was interviewing me as a um, a youth, and he he was like, "All right, Mitch, pocket pool. You playing some pocket pool?" <laughs> and I had no idea. I was like, "What the hell is pocket pool? <laughs> what <laughs> that kind of stuff?" I I had no idea, and so. Even all the way up until I was 16, I just, I was, I, I guess I was in a, a daze. I was just like, why? Well, I, I had no idea that these things happened and my world is shattered. And, um, and, and then I moved, I moved. Um, I got to a point where I, I needed to be with my dad and uh, I made the choice to move up to Idaho and once I got there, I remember being at this, this, the, I guess a cross line of like, I still held my core beliefs of the LDS church, but I was really struggling with my identity because of the divorce, because of the, because not even knowing what sex was or how it works until I was uh, 15. And when I got to Idaho, up in Idaho, it's a northern, it, it's clear up in the panhandle. It's if you're familiar with uh, obviously Boise, but two hours north of Boise is McCall. And then two hours north of McCall is Kuski. And it's beautiful up there. You, It's back, you know, it's up in the mountains, beautiful green rolling mountains with tons of thick, dense forests and rivers. Um, so it's nothing like the southern part of Idaho. A lot of people, when I say I'm from Idaho, they're like, yeah, I'm sorry. And I'm like, no, 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 no. You got to go to northern Idaho. So I went up there and these, the school I attended, the high school I got transferred to that my brothers were also going to was there was only 150 kids. So I went from Utah, from this huge populated, these huge populated junior highs and high schools all predominantly Mormon to 150 kids. And basically my brothers and I were the only Mormons. And so I was, I was forced with, I was, I was, I faced this decision whether I could continue to just kind of flirt with the line and be like, I don't, I don't really know and stand up for my beliefs. And at that time, and I often think about this, at that time, I needed to stand for something. I needed it desperately. Um, I didn't know that as at the time, um, but now when I reflect on those years and I ask why, you know, I, I still believe, but man, I, I took, I, I did a 180. I went from just kind of being the quiet kid to, I was I was that a that was that kid that if there was someone was swearing, I would tell them to stop. I'd be like, hey, stop. You don't need to swear. If you swear, just please go cuss somewhere else. And a lot of people started respecting me for it. And I and sometimes I'm like, now I look at those like I when I went to college, I looked some some kids would do that, and I'd be like, I can't believe I did that. Like that's so to a point of like, you respect me, but I don't respect your lifestyle, but you better as hell respect my lifestyle or I'm going to tell you to get out of the room. Um, and it was for, you know, even though I look back now and I'm like, Oh geez, I was, I was kind of intense. I needed, like I said before, I needed to stand for something. And so I grabbed hold really hard and, and my dad is, it still is very, very LDS and he's very traditional, very, ooh, he's, he's, uh, he's one of my heroes too. He, he's, he stands up for what he believes in. He sticks to his guns. And I learned a lot from that. I learned a lot from that. And so, yeah, he, he helped with that. When I got up there, he kind of got me back into the traditional, you know, make sure you read your scriptures every night and pray and, and, and so I got onto this kind of path of like, hey, 
I'm, I'm going to stand for my religion. I'm of, I'm, no one else here is Mormon. And it, it helped to be honest. I've it helped a lot. One of the things I've noticed, uh, you know, I often ask myself, what is it that makes some progressive and post Mormon speak out and others just, uh, stay quiet or, or don't speak out. And there's no judgment there. Everyone mm. has a certain, certain levels of privilege. I'm like dripping, yep. soaking with privilege. So yep. it would almost be outrageous if I didn't speak out. There are other people that because of who they're married to or who their parents are, or what their job is, or their, or their personality profile or whatever, socioeconomic status, education level, they just can't speak out. But one trend I have noticed whether it's Bill Real or, or Sam Young or Kate Kelly or others, is that a lot of the people that end up speaking out, and you're speaking out uh, mm -hmm. on TikTok in a very bold and almost jarring but also profound way, is is that is that those people were often some of the most devout, committed Mormons, at least at, at certain points in their life. Yes. And that that level of commitment and devotion just kind of carries through to to a different side, right? Yeah, I completely agree with that, and and that, um, as as a, a teenager, young adult in high school, I I went the whole nine yards, man. I I started reading the Book of Mormon cover to cover multiple times as fast as I could. President Hinckley was my prophet. That's why a lot a lot of people will say that he's the one I can impersonate the best, is because I. I watched everything that he did. I watched his every move because I was, he was my hero. Um, and, and I, when he, I, you probably remember this back in early two thousands, he, he um, challenged the members to read the book of Mormon within, what was it? 90 days. I can't, I can't remember. Yeah. That <laughs> Short amount yeah. of time. A super yeah. short amount of time. <laughs> he challenged every member to read the Book of Mormon. And boy, I jumped on that. I read it within a month. And I was just like, yep, this is true. This is true. And uh, I thought it was in a month. I thought it was in a month. Was it a month? I it, thought. You're, you're, you're right. I, I can't remember. I couldn't remember if, if it was longer than that. But yeah. Our listeners can remind us. They're, they're, yeah. They can text us. Yeah. Yeah, they, they definitely can. Um, I And so I... Um, yeah, as as a teenager, I I lived for it, um, and I got invested, and I I had experience after experience, um, and and just I was so so excited to go on my mission. I was so excited. I was it was, and and this can this can this is a topic in and of itself. The um, missionary work or how it's um did you get were you called did you serve i, I was i i served in south korea from 06 to 08 oh wow and okay so uh missionary work in and of itself among other things you're taught that from primary in the church from primary on and in your home from the moment that you can understand what missionary work is. And I, um, I remember as a young adult, just looking forward to that, looking forward, um, to serving, serving the Lord, going out and teaching the gospel. And it was exciting. It was new. I was like, I can't, you know, every, every missionary wants to go to a foreign country. And, and so I was like, you know, I'll be, I was, I was, you know, said all the right, I'll, I'll be so grateful for the, if I go to, to Idaho or Utah or Nevada, like, I know it doesn't matter. The Lord's work is the Lord's work. But secretly I was like, I, I want to go, I <laughs> go across seas. Um, I want to go to a foreign country. I want to go far, far away and experience a new culture. And, and I was lucky. I was, I guess, for lack of a better term, blessed. The Lord heard my prayer. Um, Really quickly, our, our listener, Aaron Glue Spencer, one of our dear, my dear friends and our, our listener, she writes, I think it was a 90 day challenge by Hinkley oh, okay. and she couldn't keep up. So it looks like it wasn't a month, it was three months, which is still a formidable a request given, given the content of the Book of Mormon and just yeah. second Nephi in and of itself to two months, three months is, a, is still a Herculean task by any stretch. Oh, it definitely is. Um, 
but I I think I me, a few of my brothers and I I think we read it twice. Um, so we were that family, <laughs> that family that was just like, yeah, Mormons. Um, so did you have a good mission experience overall? I, I did. I had a, an amazing experience. And even after I've left, obviously I look back and I go, man, I would do so much different, but to be honest, I made so many, and I know, I know there are many, many members uh, and and missionary return missionaries that have left the church that had just had um, such painful, hard experiences, um, and so uh, to be honest, a lot of missionaries I talk to that have left the church have talked about their painful experiences on their missions, and so me saying I had such a great experience, it's I, in my own experience, it's actually not common. Um, but I know there are many members um, alike and, and ex-Mormons alike that have had wonderful experiences. Um, but yeah, so I, when I left, you, on, served, oh, you served the full two years and had a good experience. I did. Mm -hmm. Wow. So what um, year did you finish? Oh, wait, the end of 08. Okay. So that's 12 years ago. Mm -hmm. Okay. Any any quick stories from your mission that were are really important to your overall story, or is it good enough just to say you had a good mission experience? Uh, really quickly, um, I'm not a specific specific stories, but a mission is basically I contribute that to my first step to thinking for myself, because um, I was around my family so much around everyone telling me, Hey, do read your scriptures, pray. And I remember on my mission, that was my first light bulb. I, and it wasn't like, Oh, all these people are saying Joseph Smith wasn't. And, and if you believe it or not, South Korea, <laughs> they've got a lot of Christians and they know about Joseph Smith. And so I remember being confronted by them being like, Joseph Smith did this and this. And I, you know, I would uh, say that's a lie and I would bear my testimony. Um, but I just remember it, it wasn't about that. It was more about, I remember thinking about a year into my mission, why do I have an agenda? If, if this is, you know, if I'm following Christ, would Christ be out here tallying numbers, trying to get people baptized, um, wanting to be their friend with the goal to get them to church? or take a discussion or commit to baptism. And I remember that's the first light bulb. And I was like, I should just be out here just to be with these people, just to serve with without any agenda. Um, and I thought it was, as I thought through that, I remember going, well, no, that's, I think that's the, the temptation to not do the Lord's work. Um, and so that's one of the things I regret. I regret not get fully listening to that prompting or my conscience saying, hey, you shouldn't be out here trying to befriend people with an agenda. You should just love them for who they are. And no matter what, even if they never, ever join the church, never, even if you don't teach them one, say one word about the LDS church, you should just be here and love them. And so I guess that's the only thing I would say is that was my first step to thinking um, for myself in that way. We have a character witness uh, of you. Uh, hey, Southworth. <laughs> Derek, Derek Southworth. Yeah. Right. I served in Korea with Mitch and I've always loved and respected him. Such a funny and caring guy. Did, are you uh, and Derek in touch or is that a, I haven't been to oh, Southworth uh, last night. Last I was in touch with Southworth was on my mission or directly after we had a couple mission reunions. But so would you have ever expected that he would be watching Mormon stories? I would not, <laughs> not have expected that. So it, that's that's incredible. Uh, Southworth, I miss you, man. It's good to see you. Good to hear. And would you. he would he have expected that you would show up on Mormon stories? <laughs> You know, to be honest, I don't think so. Maybe, maybe <laughs> I'd be surprised, but I was a pretty, pretty devout missionary. So a lot of us <laughs> were, but, uh, but yeah, <laughs> that's, that's, that's incredible. 
Um, let me ask you this just quick. I, I know that your, your profession's acting, is that right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So when did you start your acting career? When did you start? Was it in plays or musicals in high school? Was yes. that before your mission or after your mission? I'm just curious. I've, I've always been, since my dad has been in, in the arts and film himself, I've always been, I've, all, I've always had that flame of like, I, I love the arts um, ever since as a kid, ever since I was a kid, I would, I would often, I was one of those weird kids that would go in the bathroom and make faces at myself in the mirror and, uh, and talk in all these weird voices. And so my, I actually started pursuing acting um, in junior high. I was in Oklahoma and Oliver as a, a made up character because they had so many kids. And then once I got to uh, Idaho, I continued um, to act and they had a very small program, but they had, it was, it was a good program um, up in Clearwater Valley. Uh, and they, I was in, I, 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 that's where, that's where the true passion arose because I remember being in plays like Much Ado About, Mo About Nothing, Grease, um, Beverly Hillbillies, uh, Charlie's Aunt, and and I loved it. I loved expressing, I loved hearing people laugh. I, I, I loved seeing that there could be joy. Um, and, and then continued after my mission, I wanted to continue, but then I was faced with the social dilemma of like, well, acting, the arts is not a very sustainable job. And this is not only a social dilemma, this is a very religious, and if I may say a Mormon based um, dilemma, I guess, is you get back from your mission, you marry as fast as you can, and you start a family and you get a job to support that family. And so I got back from my mission, and instead of pursuing my career, what did I do? I went on a wife hunt. I was like, who's going to marry me? I got to get married. I got to start a family. I'm so excited um, to start a family. I'm going to do it right. I'm not going to do what my parents did. Um, Meaning and not get divorced, right? Not get divorced. And uh, But I was so anxious. I was so anxious to get married. Because that's, I mean, my mission president, uh, my exit interview was like, Elder Shira, you need to get married as fast as you can. If you get home, that should be your first priority while you're pursuing school is to get married and start a family. And so that's what I wanted. And I got back and started uh, looking for a, an eternal companion. Where'd you look? I, I, so I first got back and stayed in Idaho for a bit and, and I didn't really, there's, you know, I didn't really at Mormon, uh, active LDS, um, women at that time, Northern Idaho, there weren't a lot. Um, and so me and my Mormon brain and I, oh, I cringe every time <laughs> I go back to that. Think the way I did was just like, I, I wouldn't even give them a chance. I'd be like, Nope, it's gotta, you gotta be active. You gotta be. And that, and to be honest, that's the only thing I was looking for. And now, I mean, it, it blows my mind, but it, you're taught that. And it, it makes me so sad that that's, is, that is what is taught or that somehow that the only thing, and this has been quoted and, and spoke of, and, and I can't, who, I can't, maybe, maybe our um, viewers can help. Maybe, you know, John, the, the leader that said that all you need to have in common is the gospel to get married. That's it. And he, I think it may have been Kimball who said that any two okay. worthy people, basically any two worthy people can make it, can make marriage work. Yes. Kind of thing. Yes. Our listeners can tell us if I'm wrong. Yeah. Um, but I, that's, that's all I cared about. To be honest, I was just like, whoever, um, Whoever is a, a, and I looked for all the stereotypical things that you would look for uh, in a, a Mormon wife. Um, I would look basically strong in the gospel, wanted to have kids, and wanted to raise a family with me. Um, I had a testimony, and and uh, and that's that thinking 
is so it it breaks my heart because of what I went through, but also so many people that may have gone through that or may be going through that. Um, and not and and I do want to say I know that not all Mormons think that way. I know that I know that the not all, all Mormons were taught the way I was taught. I'm just saying that there's a common ground that these these uh, principles are constantly taught and you're conditioned to go on a mission, you're conditioned to get married in the temple, you're conditioned to want these things to be accepted um, in that community. Um, and so, but, but a lot of, a lot of people get past that point of it's, it's subconsciously you, you might be doing it for acceptance and I, I, I will speak for myself subconsciously. I believe I was doing it for acceptance, but consciously I was, I was on a different road. I was doing it for the Lord. I was doing it for, um, because it was the right thing to do. Um, and so, yeah, I, it took me a while. I, I was I was one of those awkward kids in high school before going back for a bit that wouldn't wouldn't date because President Hinckley said you shouldn't go steady. So I took that to heart, didn't date, didn't kiss, didn't hold hands. I was like, no, my mission is my goal and whoever stands in my way. So help me. Um, so I didn't do any of that. So I had no experience when I got back. I was the most awkward return missionary on the face of this earth. I would ask to hold someone's hand. I'd be like, hey, can I just, is it okay if I just slap, hold your hand? And it made things so awkward that the girls would be like, what, what, why are you, why are you asking to hold my hand? And I'd be like, I don't, I don't know. I, I don't know how to do this. <laughs> and so it was it made for a lot of awkward dates. And uh, I chased a lot of girls away because, man, I just knew what I wanted. And I'd be like, I like you. We'd go on one date and I'd be like, I like you. I like you a lot. We should date because I know you have it. And, and I didn't say this outright, but in my mind, it was like, man, she's she's strong in the gospel. I can feel it. And I feel the spirit telling me this and this. And I that this she she's a she's a prospect. I should date her steady right now and man i scared scared a lot of girls and i feel bad but um so uh i finally met uh my then wife and i'll explain um my journey more but i i am divorced now spoilers and a wonderful wonderful woman and she how, how soon did you get married how we started dating in, let's see, 2011, 2010, and we got married. We, so we, we started officially dating the very beginning of 2011, and we, we got married in the, the summer of that same year, 2011. And you got off your mission? I got off my mission the end of 2008. Basically, to, it, was, it was New Year's Eve of 2008. Okay, so it took you a year couple of years to find a yeah. special someone. Yeah. Okay. Well, you did your best, you know? Yeah, <laughs> I did. Uh, by Mormon standards, I guess I was pushing forward, but, <laughs> but uh, and I guess for my own experience, it was, I, that's all we had in common was the gospel. And, and now looking back, at what that and that's that's why I feel so strongly about it. That's why, I, um, and I know I'm 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 aware that a lot of things may and are changing with that rhetoric in the church. But from my own experience, knowing and taking personal responsibility of going, no, all you need to do is find someone that's basically any any. And now looking back, as simply and as as brass as it might as this might sound, as any girl that has a testimony and wants to have a family and is attracted to me and likes me is a candidate. Um, 
One of our listeners, Aaron, she writes, Kimball said, uh, Kimball said that about marriage partners and then repeated many times again by other church leaders. I definitely remember John, by the way, preaching that at BYU Fireside's crazy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and that's kind of interesting. I did a I did a short little video on uh, my new YouTube channel called Under Understanding Mormonism, where I, in a long litany of risks associated with uh, being in the church, you know, and there are so many positives, but there are risks. And one of the risks I mentioned was people being rushed into marriage and kids too quickly. Mm -hmm. So many people freaked out and said, that's not what the church teaches. And oh. it's, and then they're able to point to a policy of an obscure policy that probably was only recently made public or written that says, you know, the number of kids to have is a sensitive thing and people shouldn't be judged. But, mm -hmm. but it's so weird that the church can just, all they have to do is issue a policy like that online so that they can sort of deny that, that, that that was ever a thing, but we all know that for a hundred yep. years, you know, for all our lives, it was get married as soon as you can. Oh yeah. And and now it's just such a weird thing because we all know that that was so heavily emphasized mm -hmm. and yet members in 2020 are like trying to say to me, it's almost like, I feel like I'm being gaslit. It's like, that's not what the church teaches. And I'm like, what church did you grow up in? <laughs> you know? Yeah. And that, that honestly makes it so hard when we're trying to have respectful conversations um, with uh, believing members now is because so many times I'll say that I'll say, you know, I was taught in the Mormon church that these, this was priority. And they'll look at me and be like, you were taught wrong. That's ne I've never been taught that. And that's, and I've, you know, at being, being out completely, of the church for a couple of years now i've just learned to just go i can't i can't argue with this because that's what the church that's the pattern of the church they have one revelation after another they make it either policy or doctrine and then when it's not acceptable anymore they have another one that goes no let's disavow that and that but they don't talk about it they don't apologize for it they don't admit that they've done it and so it gets these mem members and, and ex-members alike to butt heads when they don't. And, and it's like, you know, Blacks and the Priesthood was another one where I've had so many conversations with people and said, this was, this was not a policy. Back, go read some Enzyme articles back in the 70s. This was doctrine. This was pre-earth life. And it just, it made, it, it, I'm sure um, ex-Mormons and progressive Mormons alike, it, it bogs you down. It's like you can't have these conversations because now even the Book of Mormon is being changed. Book of Mormon or or interpreted differently from, from saying, blatantly saying and being taught. I'm one of the ones that remembers the skin of darkness. The Lord caused a skin of darkness to come upon the Lamanites to separate them because of the, their wickedness. And now I'm seeing this new rhetoric of, no, 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 that was never a thing. Never, ever a thing. God never would do that. It's a spiritual darkness. It's a, it's a countenance. It's, it was yeah. referring to the I, countenance, not the I'm actual skin. Like, Can you, are you kidding? A skin of darkness and it's changing and it just, it, it makes, it makes us take two steps back to go when we're trying to bring awareness to these harmful, harmful things, many harmful things that are taught, that we were taught, and that are suddenly, poof, they're gone without any recognition of like, hey, you know what, we actually did teach that, and that was really wrong and really close-minded, and it's hurt a lot of people. It's just, and, and that's what makes it so hard. How long, how long were you married in your first marriage, Mitch? Seven years. That's that hit the seven year itch. You basically made it to the seven year itch. Yep. Yep. Uh, and, and, uh, we, you know, it was like, I Let said, me ask you what, what profession did you and or your wife pursue in terms of school or work? And then what are you able to, you know, I don't want to dig for dirt. I know that our relations are sensitive. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, and what, what, what are you able to talk about in terms of that dynamic? Especially knowing that you probably like me, your number one goal was not getting divorced, right? Yep. Yep. Um, 
Exactly. Uh, and so as career wise, and this, this is one of the many uh, things that, that I will take so much responsibility for is I, in my heart of hearts, I wanted to pursue acting. I wanted to be an artist. I wanted to pursue film, but I was at this battle within myself and I was like, I, I can't do that because I won't be able to support my, that's not a traditional Mormon family. It's not a traditional American family. Like I've got to go out and get a nine to five job. I mean, now I'm saying this as a uh, memory. I, I wasn't thinking exactly the way I'm uh, uh, relaying it now, but I wanted to find a job. I was looking for something different. I've always wanted to teach. And so I was like, well, I'll be a teacher. I'll go and be a teacher. And so, and I remember talking with uh, my wife then and, and saying, first, I would say, well, I want to do this, and, but I, I, I want to be an artist and I want to act. And so for a second, early in our marriage, I started to pursue it. And I could tell that it wasn't good. I could tell um, that it wasn't what, it couldn't be supported within the narrative of the Mormon family. Because I found out quickly as a filmmaker, as an actor, you move, move, move. You go from one job to the next and, uh, you know, you, you don't. And so it's hard. It, when I saw that narrative, I was like, I can't, I can't do it. I can't do that. Um, and so I didn't. I said, no, nope, I'll, I'll do that as a hobby and I'm going to start looking for something else. So I wanted to be a seminary teacher. I was like, I love the gospel. I'm going to teach seminary. Oh, and I, wow. heard that, I, uh, I heard that Utah State had a wonderful program up there. And so I was, I started looking into that and I was like, yep. And I told, and this is an interesting, I remember praying about it and having a revelation. Um, and I look back on this and, and I wish I would have done it differently, but I, I was one of those priesthood holders that when I had a spiritual experience, I would let my wife know and be like, and it wasn't like, we're doing this, pack your bags. I would let her know that I, I would make sure she knew that it was a revel or a spiritual experience. And as a priesthood holder, um, and not, not to be, you know, like I said before, I, it wouldn't be for the, the point to be like, you have to follow me. I've had this revelation. So just do what I say. It was just that rhetoric that I was used to. It was like, oh my, and I was so excited. I was like, oh my God, I, I had a revelation. I had this spiritual experience that I'm supposed to go to Utah State and be a seminary teacher. Oh, okay. And I was so excited. And I told my wife and she, I could tell she was a little hesitant, but she was like, okay. She did, she did the, the Mormon supportive thing, um, which I'm appreciative of, appreciative of. And she supported me. She was like, okay. So we moved to Logan went to Utah State and I started to go take classes to be a seminary teacher. And immediately I sat down and I would listen and, and keep in mind that, you know, I hadn't really, I'd had a few light bulbs, a few questions, but I would just shove them away. And I remember sitting down in one of those classes and just something wasn't right. I was like, and I took it as, oh, you're, you're Satan's tempting you because you had a clear revelation that you were supposed to be a seminary teacher. So you just got to stick with this because once, you know, another rhetoric, once you get a revelation, once the Lord speaks, Satan comes in, boom. So I thought that I was like, no, I got to stick with this. But every time I went, I something didn't feel right. I didn't like how they were telling teaching. And it wasn't because I disagreed with the gospel. It just didn't sit right. I was like this I and so I I ended up not doing it and um, there was a film program that just opened up and I remember going and checking it out and that feeling that you feel which I know so many can relate where you know you found what you want to do and I was I was glowing <laughs> I went to that uh, open house to to introduce the new degree of film 
at that place at, at, at USU. Mm -hmm. It's not there anymore. It, it was a they tried it, and it was in conjunction with uh, I think Slack. Slack. So, Salt Slick Community. Salt Lake City Community College. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. Sorry, uh, Slick. Um, and uh, what you would do is you would go two years at Utah State, learn the technical sides of uh, theater and film, and then you would go get transferred down to Salt Lake City and hands-on start doing films. Um, and so I was like, okay, this is what I'm going to do. And then so how uh, long? I, I have to ask, how long were you at, at in Logan at Utah State, and what five, years? I, I so we moved in 2014, and I graduated in 2019. So oh just, wow! Okay, so we overlapped. I uh, I was there in 2014 and 2015. That's I got excommunicated in Cache oh, really? Valley. So oh. I, and I was I graduated with my PhD from Utah State in 2015. So. We would have inter we would have uh, overlapped those two years. We probably yeah. passed each other at one point or another. I was yeah, a counselor probably. in the. Man, I was I a love, counselor in the. What's that? I said I love love Utah State. It's it's. I, go I, Aggies. I, yeah, go Aggies. <laughs> I'm a, I'm a Cougar Aggie, but uh, I was in yeah. the counseling center. So, did did you ever go to the counseling center at Utah State? Uh huh. Okay. Yeah, I would have been there. Oh, okay. I, I went just a couple of times. Yeah. But that's awesome. <laughs> yeah. So we were there at the same time. You would have been yeah. there when I got uh, excommunicated. And um, I, I do, uh, I, we do have a, a listener who it's, it's Win Marino. He writes in, I remember these oh, conversations yeah. with you way back when in Logan, man, how far we have come. I'm so proud of you, dude. Do you remember Win? Yep. Oh yeah. When, when, uh, a shout out to Win, man. When I was going through my transition, he was there, and he's one who's been through a lot of that uh, himself. He went through a lot of the same things that we've all gone through, and that was that's jumping forward to two thousand, yeah, two thousand fifteen, sixteen. I think I believe sixteen is when I first met Win, and uh, he really. I remember bringing these doubts to him that I was having. Um, it may have been two thousand seventeen, but. Anyway, regardless, he really talked through, and he was, and I'm, I appreciate when, um, and so many like this because what he did is he, he said he would encourage me to follow my heart. He would say, Mitch, just do what you know is right. If you stay in the church, that's awesome, that's wonderful. If you don't, that's wonderful. But all you, you just need to follow your gut, follow your heart. And that's all that matters. So, so this is only a few years ago. So we're mm -hmm. talking three or four years ago where you're at Utah state mm -hmm. having a faith crisis. Is that right? That's right. Yep. Um, and Oh, go ahead. And oh. I don't want to, I don't want, I don't want that comment to pull us off the timeline. So that's okay. you, you said that once you found out about this acting program, maybe mm -hmm. this joint program with Utah state and slick, you feel like you had found your calling, is that right? Yeah, so it was a film program, and then I decided um, to, uh, let's see, I, oh, I, as part of that film curriculum, I was required to take beginning acting, which was, I was so stoked about. And I remember getting into that class and starting to do the work, and the professor, uh, Richie Call, who still teaches up there, amazing, amazing man, took me aside and he said, Mitch, if you want to keep doing film, keep doing film, but I'm telling you, you should at least audition for the acting program. And so I took it to heart and I've always wanted to act, always, always uh, in conjunction with film. And and so I took it to heart and I, dish, I, I auditioned and I got in and I was jumped so fast from film to acting. And then I was in the acting program, which is a very rigorous four year cohort program where you start with the same people and end with the same people. And you go through very specific um, uh, classes building up to the, to your graduation. And then you have a showcase in New York city. And man, I remember when I, and again, my responsibility of 
letting my wife know then that I, just, I, I told her, I said, I just need to be an actor. I need to pursue arts. And I remember that was hard because I had set up this, I had set up this vision of what our family was going to be. And we, I'm, I'm sure we both had it. And, and not only I had set it up, but this is going back to conditioned of what a Mormon family looks like, my own personal past of divorce and what I carried with me into that marriage. Um, and so we, we did only have the gospel in common. And so when I said acting, I knew that it was going to be hard on our marriage. And I didn't want to, but I didn't want to not be me for the sake of someone else. I didn't want to, I was getting also getting to the point where I was, I'm a people pleaser. I pleased all my life. And I, I got to this point at Utah state where I was like, no, I, I'm going to drown. If I keep doing this, I got to start doing what I know I need to do. So I auditioned, got into the acting program. Um, I remember a counselor there in the theater department that told me when I started um, with all well intentions, she knew I was Mormon. She was Mormon herself. And she said, are you sure you want to do this? This isn't for a Mormon family. Um, and that scared me. I was like, oh, well, yeah, yes. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, this is what I want to do. Um, and, it, and the interesting, the, the beautiful thing about arts and why I love the arts and why it drives me is because you, in my opinion, some can disagree with me and that's, and that's wonderful. In my opinion, you cannot be an artist without expanding your mind. You cannot pursue arts. You cannot create art unless you're willing to expand your mind and at least jump to the other side and go, okay, I'm willing to drop those barriers and think outside the box. I'm willing to be uncomfortable. And that is art. <laughs> that is acting. That's that my experience with acting. And so I started taking these roles where there was cussing. And I remember going, I can't, I can't, I can't swear. And it was the F-bomb and Jesus Christ and these plays that, that, that were just full of all this language. And I was like, I can't do that. And I remember... Um, making my justifications with the help of uh, a professor who was also LDS there. And, uh, and I said, okay, I'll do it. And so I started taking these roles and my mind started to blossom. And I started to see other perspectives. And it wasn't just comedy. I, I was in, in straight plays that were very serious and very had such serious themes that made me think so hard and made me so uncomfortable, but it was the right path. I was like, I, this feels uncomfortable, but I need to keep doing this. I need to keep thinking outside of my own experience. And that was, I would say another huge step towards my transition out of the church. I was still very active, but I started to think for myself a lot more instead of think the way that I was taught to think and feel. Um, you no, know, I'm, 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 let me jump in here just for a sec. I, I think about, I mean, there's the stereotype of the artist, whether it's Bono or Ben Affleck or, you know, pick your activist artist where they're kind of mocked. And hmm. I want to put that aside for a second because I follow popular culture and if I'm just being totally honest with just my radar and my impression of artists, when I hear an artist speak again, whether it's sting or, or, uh, uh, Matt Damon or whoever, mm -hmm. they, they, they often come across to me as articulate and as super thoughtful. And some of my li listeners or viewers may totally not agree. That's fine. If you, if you hate, if you, if you, if you don't like, uh, or don't agree with me, but 
I've often wondered what exactly is it about the performing arts that seems to cater to thoughtfulness. Mm -hmm. And I mean, you're kind of explaining it, but, but, yeah. uh, you know, when I watch your, your TikTok videos, there's clearly, they're not just like, you're not just doing an impression. Mm -hmm. They're, they're scripted in a way. And I don't know how much it's spontaneous versus you work on the script at a time, but there's a lot of thought. There's a lot of thought that goes into that. And uh, it's often just made me wonder what is it about the performing arts that leads to thoughtfulness? It, it, and yeah, and that's, that's uh, to be honest, switching from my traditional Mormon brain to the next part, my progressive Mormon brain, I became an advocate of making someone uncomfortable, not inappropriately, but just making them think, making them hit that wall and go, why am I uncomfortable right now? <laughs> Watching a play. And, and, and Cash Valley is predominantly Mormon. And so these Mormons would come to these shows and some of them would get up and leave and walk out because they were brass. They were, they'd make you so uncomfortable. And, and I started going, this is needed. People need to, and it doesn't mean that you get uncomfortable and you have to agree. No, it means just going to that other side, letting that wall fall and letting yourself think about what, what are these characters going through? Because for me personally, my old Mormon brain, the traditional one, when I would see an R-rated movie or even a PG-13 or a play that was, that had sex jokes or, or swore or had nudity or, or presented themes that made me uncomfortable, I would shut it down. I'd be like, nope, the spirit's gone. And now my progressive Mormon brain in 2015, 16, I was going, that's not the spirit leaving. That's because I'm uncomfortable. I'm uncomfortable with this content. And I started, and that's, and that's why I say in the arts, you're forced to ask why when you hit that wall, why am I uncomfortable right now? Why do I feel this way when someone says the F, you know, F you, why do I feel this way when, when there are sexual themes talked about very, very blatantly in a play or death or religion? And so I began to go, no, I need to, I need to embrace this uncomfortable and, and push against the wall and step to the other side again, not to go, I'm going to agree with everything this play or this theme is, but to at least go to the other side and, and basically ask what would I do or what, what are these people experience? If I experienced this, would I be acting this way or would, what would this cause me to do if I was presented with this situation? And as an actor, I learned very quickly that I started to have this um, awakening, I guess, where I would be presented with these roles and I would, I would start preparing. And some of them were hard to, to put my mind around and my heart around because I didn't agree with what they were doing. Even as a progressive Mormon, I would be like, uh, no. And then I started to go, I was taught very, very well. And Utah State, a shout out to them. That program is a wonderful program. It's it's a hidden gem. So if you are in the arts and you like acting, go check it out. I, I didn't even know USU had an acting program. A lot I of people there for I went to nine years of grad school at USU. <laughs> <laughs> you know, honestly, a lot of people don't. And that's why I say it's a hidden gem because they're what what they do, what they put on, and and the reason I I admire them so much is because they do what art should do in a very religious community. They don't go, well, we're just going to, and, and I'm not bashing anyone that does this. Art is beautiful, but it, the art for me and my personal experience and what I 
lean towards is art that inspires change or makes makes you think. And so these the this art program would put on these plays that went against every Mormon standard, every religious standard of like, no, nope, you don't talk about that, you don't swear, you don't, you know, this and this. And they they said, no, this is this is what it is. This is what art is. And they didn't do it. And on the flip side, they did have a lot of wholesome plays. They didn't do it just to the other side and push them like, no, we're just going to only do these brass plays. But uh, yeah, they, they're, they're a great program, but I, I learned, I learned to open my mind <laughs> and it was that that's a huge step towards my transition out of the church. Yeah. As I think about it, as I, as I'm kind of thinking about my own question to you and reflecting back what I've heard from you and other things, one thing that comes to mind is as an actor, you have to, it seems like you would have to learn to develop empathy for people who aren't you, yeah. the who, people who don't have your perspective. Cause if you're going to play a murderer or a killer or a priest or a, you know, a, an abuse abuser or an abuse victim, you won't have had all the experiences that uh, the roles you play have had. Mm -hmm. And so you have to, I'm sure you have to do even homework to get in the shoes of the character you're playing Exactly. Learn, learn about what it's like to be them. And so you're forced into empathy, which is something we, as Mormons, we probably don't excel at. We don't excel at empathy. Yeah. We're focused on like, here's the life you're supposed to have. Here are the feelings you're supposed to feel. Here are the thoughts you're supposed to think. Here are exactly. the ways that you're supposed to behave. Fit the mold. Wear a white shirt. Wear a tie. Go on a mission. Get married quick. Have a job. Raise your kids. Follow the brethren. Yeah. That's not, that's not a, preparatory for empathy, right? That's not a laboratory for empathy. But as an actor, you're doing that. Plus, acting is supposed to make you feel. It's supposed to challenge you. You know, art is supposed to make you feel. Art is yep. supposed to challenge you. And art is a lot of the ways that, you know, if you think about how did LGBT rights get accepted in the United States? It's when Ellen, an actor, does a show and comes <laughs> out and all of a sudden through that, you know, any LGBT person will say that there's sort of before Ellen and after Ellen, right? And, 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 or, uh, yeah. And so, and so I, I think the arts, you know, I often think about like getting an advanced education can be perilous. Becoming a historian can be perilous to faith. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, if I think about Mindy Gledhill or Tyler Glenn or Dan, Dan Reynolds or, a yeah. lot of the entertainers that have come on Mormon stories. Yeah. It just seems like those dynamics of, of being an artist can, can make faith become more and more tenuous. Yes. Um, and I, I completely agree. And that's what started happening. That's exactly what started happening. I, I was, uh, um, I was forced to think outside of myself and start putting myself in other people's shoes. And, uh, and ironically, that started, not ironically, thankfully, that started happening in my, not just in my character work, but in my life. I started to think outside the box. Um, and I started letting myself not immediately close off when I had a thought that I was told, nope, don't do that. I would go, why? Why Why? Why am I uncomfortable right now? And is, is it because, and, and you, you know, I've, as I learned this, it was, this is a human behavior. It's because something within you, it's never another person. If you react a certain way, it's because of something within you that's making you uncomfortable. And so I started to learn this, which brings me to my next huge step is I, um, in that, in the program, and the, there were uh, a few friends that were LGBTQ plus. And as a Mormon, it was hard to, feign acceptance, even though I did accept them, but I, in the back of my mind, I was like, yeah, no, I can't, I can't uh, truly accept them for who they are, but I can love them. And, and I, I think a lot of people know what that narrative is. And I became really good friends with, um, uh, one of these fellow actors in the program, Scotty Zaborski. And he, we can't be came so close and he this this was such a wonderful loving man accepting man and i i was like why 
why are we taught they're uncomfortable thought of why are we taught that these back then when I was young and now the narrative has, has changed just like you, you and I have discussed John back then when I was young, if you were gay, you were a pedophile. I was told that I was, that narrative was taught to me. Not that, you know, no one sat me down and said, now listen, Mitch, if you ever have these, this and this and this, uh, you're a pedophile. No, I, kids absorb. I remember conversations that my dad and uncle would have. I remember my mom and dad talking about it. I remember seeing as a kid, we were on a trip and two men holding hands and my dad almost lost his shit and he got the family away. And I was just like, oh, I didn't know what was happening. And so I reached this point where I was like, why am I uncomfortable? with this man who has shown me nothing. We're good friends, but I still feel uncomfortable. And so I started to peel it open. And I started, I said, and he used to be LDS. And I said, Scotty, I have a lot of these narratives in my head. And I remember the night we were, we'd been playing Nintendo games, just having a blast. And I said, I remember, uh, I said, there, there's these, narratives in my mind that say that I've been taught that say that you are a sinner. And I said, I'm going to be blunt. And we, we, we had a close enough relationship where we could talk very openly. And I said, I'm going to be blunt and I'm not I'm meaning to be offensive, but I want you to tell me your experience because what I have in my mind, my narrative is that if you're gay, you've been molested. If you're gay, you chose to be gay because of some kind of problem in your past. Um, and if you're gay, you have inappropriate thoughts about children. And it was hard for me to say, and I said it, and he told me his story. And it blew my mind. It blew my mind and I started to go, something is wrong with this. Something is wrong with these, you know, Scotty, who something's wrong with, with these religious teachings that are telling us that these people, that these human beings, these loving, wonderful people are not worthy, are tainted are going to hell. And I started to, I started to disagree with what the church had peddled to me. And when he told me this beautiful story of his progression in life, and, um, and he told me, he said, no, that I never was molested. My, uh, and he said, Mitch, I was never molested, but let me be clear, even if someone is molested, that doesn't make them gay. And you need to get that out of your head immediately. Um, and then he told me a story about his exit of the church. He told me stories and his experience about shock therapy. Um, when he found out that BYU did studies about it, he, he told me stories about being shunned from church, being when he started to come out, being shunned from his own family. Um, and the theme of that story was, I'm not going to apologize for who I am. And, he's, and, and he said, I've gotten to a point that this is who I am. And I can no longer affiliate with a church that tells me, we love you, but don't be you. And that hit home. I was like, why, why am I here, a, a very, <laughs> very privileged white male, straight white male, and I have all these privileges within the church and I'm treated so differently. And that was a huge catapult. I started looking at women uh, going, why are they treated differently? Why can't they have the priesthood? Why are, why are these things building up? And, and it, I, I started, so many thoughts started colliding in my mind that I thought I was going crazy because it, it like opened a door. And the wall broke down and it was just like all these thoughts that I'm sure I had since I was a kid that I shelved 
um, just came crashing out and I started to question. And I knew that I disagreed with how the church was treating the LGBTQ plus community and how they treated and how they treat even now them and women. And I disagreed and I started becoming even more of a progressive Mormon um, where I, I wouldn't, I, if, if I heard someone saying that, you know, we love you, but you can't go to heaven. They wouldn't say it that bluntly, but basically that's what they were saying. I would start going, no, no, I don't, I don't like that. Like that's, if you heard, if your logical brain could hear you right now, that just, you know, it's wrong. You know, it's wrong. So why, why do you go through, jump these through hoops? But I have sympathy and empathy for that because I went through it. I, I jumped through a lot of those hoops to try and justify that wall staying intact. Maybe, maybe this is a good time to play your uh, doubt your doubts video really quick. Is that okay? Yeah, of course. All right. Let's, let's hear this is uh this is Mitch Shira uh, as Genie Man on TikTok, uh, doing another one of his famous impressions. Tell us who this is an impression of. This is Thomas S. Monson. Okay, uh, talking about doubting your doubts. Is that right? That's correct. All right, let's play it. I remember not too long ago, I began to dive into the church history. There, I began to find things contrary to what was taught to me while growing up in primary. On one occasion, I read an account that struck me as odd. I brought this account to my dear bishop, and there I told him of my doubts. He looked at me, and with a twinkle in his eye, he said, Tommy, you must know, you must doubt your doubts before you doubt your faith. I looked at him, and with a twinkle in my eye, I told him, why, Bishop, that's complete bullshit. I remember not too long ago. <laughs> oh, my gosh. I love that so much. As someone who as someone who grew up with, with Thomas S. Monson, yeah, that's yeah. spot on, brother. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, he's another one that uh, right after Hinckley, I, I idolized and listened to every word. But. Yeah. Okay. So, I mean, I just thought, you know, you're starting to have in your narrative, you're starting to have doubts and questions and, mm -hmm. and that it's perfectly, yeah. I doubt your doubts and that's what I started to do. Doubt. Yeah. And you were doubting you that you were honestly doubting everything you've been taught for your whole life. Right. Yeah. So that mm -hmm. becomes very confusing. Yeah. And at that point I wasn't like, it was mainly around just these issues of like, basically equality and true acceptance. And it triggered my experience on my mission where I had the same kind of thing of like, why do I have an agenda? It's the same thing. Why do I have an agenda? Why does love, why should love and acceptance have this agenda? We love you if you do X, Y, Z. But if you don't do that, yeah, we still love you. It doesn't make sense. It's like, no, love is love. You you accept, and that's, and I, I started, this conundrum started going on where I was reading the New Testament and Christ's love was unconditional. And I knew that. And I started to go, why is it conditional in this true, in, in this true, one and only true church? Why is it conditional? If Christ's love is unconditional, then it should be unconditional. Plain and simple. Um, and so from there, I remember these thoughts starting to come into my mind and, and it, and also from being in the arts, just not, I, I think I just started flexing that muscle in my brain of like, I'm uncomfortable. Instead of going like this, I would go, why let's dig into it. And I started to see things. So my journey is a little, I, I, I had heard about church history, the actual uh, true narrative of uh, church history. And I, that was one wall that I just was like, nope, that's lies, lies, lies. And they, and they teach that hard. And that's probably one of the reasons why it was a very, very strong wall is because you don't look outside church sources. You just don't. And that's, it's, if you do, it's basically 
denying the spirit and going to Satan's side. And that might sound so blunt, but honestly, that is exactly how they, that's, that's the impression that you get. And I'm sure you went through this, John. I'm sure so many did of the first time that you kind of go, maybe I should just put this website in. And, oh, yeah. Oh, no, no. Pornography. And it's not even pornography. It's just, it's just a blog of some ex-member sharing their experience. And you treat it like it's this, this uh, terrible, terrible thing. But anyway, I before that, I was very, I started to get uncomfortable in church because of the way the church's stance on the LGBTQ plus community and women in the priesthood. And I started to get uncomfortable with other things because I was reading the New Testament and I was going, Christ's love is unconditional. It should be unconditional. But then I remember sitting in elders quorum and hearing a lesson on tithing. And I got uncomfortable and I was like, why am I uncomfortable? Let's think about this. And I went down this rabbit hole on tithing of going, wait, 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 wait. So in order for us to be truly accepted by God, to be truly admitted into the highest degree of heaven, we are required to pay money, 10% of our income, to get a club pass to go into these buildings and have these, you know, get these endowments and, 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 and that when I, and I obviously I didn't think of that exactly that way at that time. That's a progression of a lot of uh, um, thoughts over the years, but that bothered me. And so I started going to my Bishop and I was like, why is tithing, on the temple recommend issue, but fast offerings are not. Why can't, why is, why is building these million dollar temples and these expensive churches? And I get, and at that time, my progressive Mormon mind, that's still Mormon. I was like, I get that it's important to go to church. I get that temple work is so important, but why are we doing this when and why is this question so prioritized over fast offerings, which um, if you're familiar with the church, that is voluntarily giving, I guess, money. When you fast, you give two, uh, you skip two meals and pay as much as you would have paid if you, um, at least as much as you would have paid if you would have eaten, bought in those two meals, bought those two meals, and then you're willing, you know, you're encouraged to pay, pay more. Um, but it's not on the Temple Recommend interview. It's not one of the questions. And those were the type of questions that started popping up in my head that didn't make sense, that were conditional. And I really, that one really bothered me. I was like, no, this isn't right. I shouldn't have to pay 10%. And the reason why it bothered me, again, aside from all that, my first red flag was whenever you're taught that lesson, it's about faith. The tithing lesson, you just pay your tithing. Faith, just do it. Don't, don't question it. And a, a brother in that uh, lesson, I remember him raising his hand and going, I just don't want to know what, I, what would happen if I didn't pay my tithing. I've had so many blessings because of it. I just, I can't imagine not paying my tithing. I, I'm scared to even know. And I was like, what? <laughs> what? And my brain exploded. I was like, no, 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 no. That's, that's not really, for me, it made me so uncomfortable. And I started to look into it. Baptism came up. I was like, why are we baptizing kids at eight? And I was still Mormon. So I'd be like, it says the age of accountability begins at eight. Why are we, why is the church going baptize them, baptize them? And I was part of the bishopric at this time. I went to the, I was uh, uh, the uh, secretary. And I would go to these bishopric meetings and they would talk about 
so and so and so little Jimmy is nine and he's not baptized and they would be so concerned about that family and it blew my mind i was like why are you concerned about this kid is nine years old and you're wanting you're, you're thinking that you need to pull this family in for an interview because the kid is nine not eight and so questions like that and and that man I guess if it's a slippery slope, once you open that door, it's like, nope. And so I started to look at the church in a much different light. And then I remember reading the, the New Testament and it, there was a, it was one of the sections with the Sadducees and the Pharisees. And I, a light bulb went off and I was like, oh my God. The LDS church is, is everything that Jesus was teaching against. Everything that Jesus was saying, don't, don't. The gospel is not about taking this many steps on Sunday and doing this and paying your tithing and going to the temple and doing all these steps. The gospel is about love and acceptance. It's about bettering yourself, becoming, for lack of a better term, in my experience, becoming more Christ-like, more God-like, whatever you affiliate with, that's what it is. And God embodies love. God is love. And so when that that hit me and I at that, that was a huge turning point. When I had that thought, I couldn't get it out of my head. And I was still very Mormon, I was still progressive. Progressive Mormon, and I um, I kept going to church, and then uh, I guess shout out to uh, my dear friends Trevor McIntosh, Eileen McIntosh. Uh, we we've been friends. Trevor's been a childhood friend of mine um, ever since uh, elementary, junior high, and he opened up and said he had left the church, and that blew my mind. I was like, no, even though I was progressive, I was like, no, what that. He had served a mission and he introduced me to the CES letter. And I had never dove into the history until that point. And I was like, you know what? There's some red flags going on. And again, I wanted to empathize. I didn't want to just be like, yeah, you read the CES letter. And I remember, uh, when I was at that point where I was open uh, enough to be like, okay, like I'm, I'm not judging you. And I remember I called them and left, <laughs> left them a voicemail as President Hinckley. And I was like, well, what a terrible thing it is when you're raised your whole life Mormon and you decide to go down Satan's path. I am so shocked at this. Please come back to the fold. I beg of you. That's not exactly what I said, but... I remember leaving a message in in good uh, <laughs> in good spirits as sarcastic, and I was still LDS, and so they got a kick out of it. Um, but that was my way of saying, "Hey, dude, I still love you. I'm not judging you." Um, but then, yeah, I uh, I read that CS letter, and uh, <laughs> that uh, that shook my entire world. But I think, uh, t tell me, tell me, don't forget where you were. Don't forget where you were right now. So remember where you're about to go with that, but, okay. but I think, uh, it'd be fun to play your, uh, your response to the CES videos, CES letter <laughs> video. Is that okay? Yeah. Yeah. That's, this is exactly basically how, uh, a lot of us feel. All right. So this is, uh, this is Mitch Shira playing Gollum. Is that right? Yep. From Lord of the Rings. Lord of the Rings, Gollum and Smeagol, I guess. Smeagol, in response to reading uh, the CES letter. Let's, let's give this a try. Oops. Uh, give me just one second for some reason that, that, uh, let me get that, let me get that video working for a second. If you can stall for just one second. Um, yeah, so the, uh, in my experience, it's, it's a little about this video. 
I remember thinking uh, a couple weeks ago, you know what? Lord of the Rings is my favorite movie of all time. And Schmeagel's scene in The Two Towers where he battles with himself is a perfect <laughs> experience. It's, it's It correlates so closely to what I and many of us have gone through who have left the church or who have, are a progressive or who have read the CLS letter in general and just had that, that foundation shaken. And so I was like, yeah, maybe uh, maybe we all have these dual voices in our head. All right, let's try this again. Should we try it now? Let's try it. All right, let's see if this works. Ah, uh, no. Huh. Having a slight technical difficulty here. Let me try one more thing. So here's the video. All right. There you go. Nature. Why does he cry? No man lies to us. <laughs> tricks us. We told you they were tricks. <laughs> we told you they were false. Master's a friend. Master's not real. <laughs> not listening. Not listening. <laughs> Go away. Go away. <laughs> Go away. <laughs> <laughs> Not, not the arm to the square. Anything but the arm to the square, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Thought that would be a nice little touch to it. I have to yeah. I have to ask just because it, it's coming to my mind. As an actor, you had to have been like impressed or turned on by the by the actors in the in the in the temple ceremony in the movie. I don't know <laughs> if you got to see like Michael Ballum play Satan. Oh yeah. I, I Did you ever like as an aspiring actor? have a, a secret part of you that someday wanted to to act in one of the temple movies or, or in any of the, you know, the Joseph Smith, yep, you know, yep. temple, t temple visitor center, you know, movies or any of that stuff. Oh yeah. Uh, yeah. I, I remember thinking when I would watch the temple videos, I'd be like, man, if I, if I can make it as an actor, it would be such an honor to play in these temple videos. Um, and, and in any LDS film, and that's honestly, I was like, yeah, I'm going to, I'm going to make it as an actor and I'd love to portray Joseph Smith and, oh, and, uh, and now, <laughs> now I'm just waiting for that true history movie to come out. And I would love to be in that. I'd be like, okay, let's do it. Let's, uh, let's, let's dive into these characters. Cause I'm so excited, but but yeah, I, I definitely aspired to be in that uh, in those temple videos. And, and um, Michael Ballum was actually um, the, the theater I acted professionally during the summers while at school, the Lyric Theater in Logan. Um, the Opera House is right next to it, and that's what Michael Ballum owns. So owns. And so I uh, I talked to him a lot and was able to pick his brain a couple of times. He's a he's a great guy. But I have a going back. Have, oh, go oh yeah, I have a listener who asked. There, there. One of the common responses. Well, there's a lot of people that most people have never heard of the CES letter. Overwhelmingly so. Hmm. Um, and I want to get back to the your line of thought or, around the CES letter, but hmm. um, there, there are a lot of people who just most people overwhelmingly don't know about it because the church is so good at creating this bubble where hmm. you can live in Cash Valley in 2014, 2015, someone's being excommunicated. It's a literally, it was a global story. It was tweeted by the New York times mm -hmm. and you didn't even, you probably didn't even know that was happening just like nope. two miles down the road. Nope. And I'm only saying that not to pull me in, but just to say the bubble, the Mormon bubble is so profoundly strong that oh. most people have never heard of CS letter, Mormon stories, any of that. That's the overwhelming majority. Yeah. And then there are some who hear about it and are influenced by it. There are others that read the CES letter and they say it strengthens their testimony. What 
Do you have any reactions? You know, so continue where you were going when mm -hmm. discussing this DS letter, but I'm also curious if you, if you have any thoughts about when, when the CES letter isn't, isn't effective, why that might be. Um, so from my experience, I remember the reason I decided to read the CES letter, um, aside from my dear friend, Trevor, um, telling me, Hey, you should read this was because I remember having another thought going, why does the church say you can't read, um, unapproved church sources? Or, or, or you can only read things that are approved by church sources. And I remember talking to my wife then, um, as and I, I was open with my transition, what I was going through. And I remember talking to her and saying, why? I said, what if you were in a neighborhood and you had this babysitter and you just paying her and she's doing such a wonderful job, but something's just not right and she's not being honest with you. And you decide, okay, I want to get references. Something's a little weird. I'm, I just want to see. And she finds out and she goes, no, don't, don't ask any neighbor. Don't ask any neighbor what I've, it, what, what their experience with me was. Just ask me. Would we go, oh, get yeah, yeah, cool. All right, you're in. Or would we go, wait a second, red flags, red flags. Why, why can't we ask? Is, are you hiding something? <laughs> and I remember having that thought and having that conversation with my then wife and, and then reading the CES letter. That was one of the reasons I was like, I, sh I should be, I shouldn't be afraid if my, and there's that narrative too. If your testimony is strong enough, you should be fine. Um, and so I read it and shook my world. And one, one of the first things that I noticed when I was reading it was, um, I was, I was reading it and I thought this, this isn't hateful. This guy is sincere. He's asking the church, why haven't you told us this? That's the gist of the letter. All the things that he brings up is asking sincerely, Hey, why, why, why am I finding out about this? from other sources, sources that you told me not to look at that would lead me astray, but they're act it's actually actual history. And that's one of the first impressions I got. And it meant, of course, my Mormon brain was firing like crazy. I was like, no, that's not true. That can't be true. That can't be true. Um, but I, that's one of the things I remember going, okay, all right, this, this guy is sincere in his quest for truth like that. And so that it didn't turn me off. I was like, okay, all right. And um, I remember Trevor reaching out to me asking if I had read it and I said, yeah. And he was like, so what did you think? And I was like, there are a lot of great points. He was really sincere, but I'm, you know, I'm not leaving. How, how many, how many years ago was this where you're actually reading the CES letter? I believe it was 2017. So it was three years ago. Mm-hmm. So shout yeah. out to Trevor for him being willing to open open his mouth. I yeah yeah I had kind of an emotional I don't want to say breakdown, but I had an emotional epif epiphany of sort of anger yesterday as I was preparing for an interview with Shannon Caldwell Montez about BH Roberts and just how long the brethren have known about these problems. Oh yeah, and for so long I just always gave them the benefit of the doubt because I just love these guys. Like I'm about to show Holland's clip, like whether it's Monson or Hinckley or Holland, I had a love affair with these mm -hmm. men as a boy and as a youth and as a teen and as a young adult, I loved and trusted these men. And that's, that's yeah. part of what makes these videos so appealing to me is because it, it's, I love them. You capture their spirit, their voice, their intonation, their emotion, but at the same, and, the, and their lovability, but at the same time, I'm so furious at them because they have been in many cases intentionally misleading us. And for so long, I didn't want to accept that. Mm -hmm. But now that I've really started thinking about it and digging in, there's no escaping the fact that they've known all that stuff in the CES letter. They've known for 120 years at least. Mm -hmm. And 
And every 10 years, there's a major event in Mormon history where they were put on notice. And every they always punished the truth teller, mm -hmm. told the members to, to cover their ears, and then lied and, and hid the truth and, uh, you know, and misled people. And mm -hmm. so it's so, uh, it's so powerful. I'm going to go ahead and play the Jeffrey Holland clip. I, okay. this, this is, this is special to me. I, uh, Jeffrey Holland was the president of BYU when I, when I attended BYU as a freshman. Oh, okay. Yeah. I dated his daughter, Mary, uh, as a oh, freshman wow. and, uh, uh, just, you know, a few times. And then I, um, I was a teaching assistant for American heritage with, with Matt Holland. So I, I played tennis with Jeff Holland. Uh, I took a religion class from Jeff Holland. Wow. <laughs> and then during my faith crisis, I met with him twice, my brother and him in, in a, in a restaurant, uh, that, that was shut down. It was just us at a restaurant, me and my brother. And so like elder Holland, when I and when I came to BYU, he and Pat gave this talk of soul symbols and sacraments. I'll never forget it. And just his passion and his charisma just uh totally was a huge influence in my life. Mm -hmm. And then when he gave that Book of Mormon talk after I met with him, he tells me he wants people like me to stay in the church. Then he gives this Book of Mormon talk in general conference with this passion saying that if you if you're going to leave the church, you have to crawl over, under, around the Book of Mormon with this rhetoric, this voice, and this intonation. It's mm -hmm. so long. I thought it was part of his, like the strength of his soul. But then I realized that it's almost acting. It's it's almost acting. The general authority voice, the the crying on cue, the trembling, and you can you can capture it in a TikTok <laughs> as an actor, and it, it sort yeah. of shows to me that that. So much of what general authorities do is acting. I know that probably sounds rude, but uh, you know that, that's just my riffing. So. Not far off. It's it's very very true. So this is Mitch Shira as Genie Man on TikTok, um, channeling Jeffrey R. Holland, and uh, th th this is just hold on to your hats, everybody. <laughs> Here goes. Among people who have left your faith, let me refresh this. Hopefully, it won't crash. Okay, here we go. Why? I ask, why come to a place obviously not intended for you? Spreading shame among people who have left your faith, which you cannot fathom the pain which they have felt. Why? To you, I say, shame on you. Shame on you. Why? Where? How? <laughs> Who? And what, my dear brothers and sisters? <laughs> oh, my gosh. I mean, it's so funny and perfect, and it's so dark. I know. <laughs> It's super you know, dark. When I when I started making these, let me tell you, my Mormon brain got triggered because when you're conditioned to think and feel that if you speak ill of the Lord's anointed, whew, you're going to hell. And I remember when I when I've been making these, I would be like, "Ooh, I my Mormon brain still there," which I believe will still be with all of us, whether or not we've left the church, and it triggered me. I was like, I, I, there are times the Packer one I hesitated posting. Cause I was like, man, that's, that's a dark, that's, that's, that's got some themes and I'm, I'm really, really pushing the envelope here. <laughs> but then I click out of it and I go, you know what? No, this is humor. This is, this is helping others. I know that. And plus it shouldn't be a justification, but where my mind is at and in my journey where I still, that anger still comes up sometimes because of what you just said. When you know that these men that you idolized were in many cases purposefully withholding, being dishonest, 
and withholding what the true history, the actual narrative of the church is, it stays with you. When you have built your entire life, your identity crashes. And of course, to all, to all maybe to, for the members and uh, that may not understand and that I've often heard of like, you shouldn't be angry. Why you're so bitter. You're so bitter. And that's like a justification that we're, we're contentious. And first of all, anger, anger is a very natural emotion that I'm still learning to embrace because of what I was taught as a Mormon kid, that narrative of anger equals contention on, unless it's righteous anger by elder Holland. Um, right. but, yeah. <laughs> but, uh, it's, it's so natural it's a part of the grieving process to be able, these men hurt so many people, not only with their dishonesty, but even the LGBTQ plus community, everything that shot, it's, it's a, it's a heavy subject. When I made that Packer video, it's a heavy, heavy subject. You're talking about these men of God approving shock therapy harming other individuals because they're something's wrong with them. Something's wrong doing emotional, physically abusive, manipulative things. And so when I go, when I have that thing pop and I go, Oh, I'm speaking ill of the Lord's anointed. I'm always like, no, this needs to be said. There needs to be some humor about this at the expense of those leaders because of all the, the pain they've caused. And so, um, I still respect, I do respect the church. I do respect members, but I'm not going to stop shedding light in a humorous way going, okay, if you're going to, you don't like my page, then move on. But if you're going to stay, then be prepared, buckle up, because I'm I'm going to be shedding some light on some things that need to be said because of the pain. So uh, you've already touched on this, but I'm just going to ask it directly. Um, you know, I did, I, again, I'm, I, I released a, a YouTube video just a couple of days ago mm -hmm. on uh, the, the LDS church and truth, truth in the I LDS church. I think it was called. Was and uh, I had, I had some dude on YouTube make a response and it's just like Mormon church is so good. Uh, the Mormon church is helping everybody. It's, it's creating great families. It's making people happy. People are happier and healthier in the church. This was the guy's argument. And he's like, what do you have against like, happy families and healthy people. Like what's wrong with you? Yeah. So if you were to respond to that question, cause you're, you know, if you haven't already received the text, you might. Um, <laughs> and somebody's, you know, and I, one of the things I love is that I, I feel from you a love for Mormonism at the core of everything you do. Mm -hmm. I think you and I share that to this day. I still love Mormonism. I feel like I had a great upbringing in it. I'm grateful for it. Grateful for every part of it really. Um, yeah. But at the same time, I'm exposed to so much harm. But instead of me doing a diatribe, how would you answer that question of like, the church does so much good. What, why, why would you spend your time on this? Of all the things you could spend your free time on, why are you attacking a church that just does so much good? What would your response be? Um, well, to be honest, uh, after working through my defense mechanism, <laughs> going, hot, no, no, but... I would, if they're in a place to listen, I would say, listen, the church, you're right. The, the church does do some good. Um, I, and exactly what you said, John, I, I, I appreciate and I hold dear in my heart, my Mormon upbringing, although it did cause pain and it did cause things the way I think the condition to think and believe to be harmful to others in my life. But Regardless of if a church does good or if someone does good, but they also are hurting other people and not just common little mistakes, not just human nature, but they are what we've talked about, knowingly keeping information, conditioning its members to look the other way. That alone is dishonest and extremely harmful. And then on top of that, you put the narrative in, you put 
how they treat the, the how they treated the blacks, how they treated and still treat the LGBT, LGBTQ plus community, how they treat women within the church. And if you can't look at that and stop and say, something's wrong, regardless of some good that an organization might do, it does not cancel out the bad. It can't. That's not how life works. And the other thing I would say, human nature is good. And this is something, going back to my story, this is something that I really struggled with. And this is the narrative and the conditioning that we all went through with you don't if you leave the church your 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 life's going to shit excuse my french but that's what you think and the minute you realize that and give yourself the credit that you are good that people human nature is good we want to do good we want to help we want to serve we want to think outside our, of ourselves we want to feel empathy we're still going to make mistakes but that doesn't mean, and that's that's one of the biggest things that hit home for me is when the church was no longer the one and only true church, it was just another religion to me. Because I believe religion has some good points, just like the Mormon church. But I believe that if a religion or an organization is doing abuse and harm and causing people emotional and physical turmoil, being lied to, telling telling someone that they're not accepted by God. You, where I stand, I can't honestly stand with that, and that's why I'm gone. I can't honestly stand with that and say, "Well, you do, you do some good. You make some families happy." When most of their, and, and in my experience and, and a lot of us, most of what they have done and are doing is actually, in my opinion, more harmful. So even if it was even, that would still not justify it to me, but it's more harmful, in my opinion. It's more harmful what they do, and what they've done, the narrative and the conditioning, conditioning that they've done to cause so many people pain. And that's why we feel betrayed is because our lives are crashing. <laughs> we didn't. We thought we knew who Joseph Smith was, not who he was, in, in the slightest. And um, and so yeah, that that's basically what I would, in a nutshell. It's a long response, but I would say that, and to to maybe practice some empathy, and to look to the other side and go, why? Yeah, but why are so many ex Mormons? Why are there so many ex Mormons? And why am I uncomfortable with this? And to look to the other side and try to stand in our shoes and feel what we felt because the anger is there, but there's also love and there's also um, independence that we're finding. But anyway, that's, it's knowing that, and that goes back, knowing that as I read the CES letter and as I started to exit the church, um, I made my justifications. I was an apologist mindset where I'd go the, the time, that argument, the time was different back then, yeah, you know, and then it went to, well, the prophets make mistakes. How can they be perfect? And then it went to, well, um, God doesn't require the prophets to always do the right thing because that's agency. And, and as I kept going down that road, I was like, I'm just jumping through so many hoops and I have to go back and go, wait, stop. What is? What did the conscience say? What did your heart say? What did the spirit tell you? What is it saying? It's wrong. It's wrong. No matter how much you justify it, the actions, some of those, so many of those actions in history and even now throughout our day are so wrong and abusive and it needs to stop. I have to feel like, you know, you in your in your story, in your narrative, you're reading the CES letter because your friend introduced it to you, and that's only three years ago. Mm -hmm. I'm guessing this is six or seven years into your marriage at that point? Yep, six. Uh, and I'm guessing that had an impact on 
your marriage. Yeah. And I think yeah. that does tie back to my question about how the church harms people because exactly. you, you chose some very specific paths and directions at very specific times and made some very specific decisions based on a certain set of understandings. And I'm sure that you of all people didn't want to have your marriage end in divorce, but, but you're, but, but, you know, six years into your marriage, three years ago, four years ago, you're having to deal with a whole level of complexity and difficulty on top of just the regular difficulties of, of just trying to keep a marriage together. I think making seven years in a marriage is a phenomenal achievement, even if it ends at seven years. Mm -hmm. But, but as the kid of a divorced family who wants nothing more than to not be divorced, it must be very painful. And I'd love to jump back into the story of how that affected your relationship with your, mm -hmm. with your ex-wife. Mm -hmm. It must've been extremely painful to have that added pressure or burden, or you could say the, the rug or the foundation pulled out from under you once you learned the truth about the church after having been taught kind of a whitewashed, sanitized, uh, dishonest narrative. Do you want to, do you want to pick up there? Is that, yeah. is that a good place to pick up? Yeah. 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 Um, and honestly it was extremely difficult, um, extremely difficult on, on both of us. Uh, and as I said before, in my personal opinion, basically all we had in common was the gospel. And so when I started that, and once we had our kids, that connected so us. So you a did lot. have kids. Uh -huh. We had uh, we have two girls, two beautiful girls. Oh wow, and that uh, that raises the stakes, right? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, and that's that was another thing that was just so difficult. And and we, I remember bringing these issues to my ex wife and going, "Hey, I I don't know if I am as strong anymore." I'm scared. I have all these issues and I would talk openly about it, but I could tell and she did her best and I and, and I appreciate her willingness to try to stick with that and to support me in my journey. But when push came to shove, it couldn't work. And I, I regardless of I mean, the red flags, when I look back that I take personal responsibility for the red flags in my own decisions, in my own personal life going forward with her thinking that the gospel is all you need in common is such a not it's that's another harmful, harmful thing to teach or to even imply. And. And I'm not blaming the church for that. I'm not saying you're, you caused my divorce. You, you, it's all your fault. I know that, that there, there were things that I did. There were, that it's not that simple, but it had a big part of our marriage because it was the only thing, one of the, of besides, aside from our children, that was the only thing that would hold us together. And so when I said, I don't, I remember telling her, I'm not going to church. I can't. And I got to that point where I was trying so hard and the easy path. This is a, a contradictory to what believing members think. The easy path was to go to church, was to just put my head down and nod and take the sacrament, go to Sunday school, go to priest, priesthood corn and keep going. That was the easy thing. I was terrified, terrified to stop because I don't have an ident identity now. And when I told, I remember getting to the point where I just said, I'm, at first I stopped going to Sunday school and priesthood and I just went to sacrament meeting uh, to be together as a family. But then I got to the point where I was like, I, I was looking and this, this was how my brain was working and, and it still does. I was going, I'm, I'm so done with dishonesty. I'm so done going to church and having to sit here listening to this narrative of these men who we idolize and praise for being such wonderful, wonderful men, regardless of the good that they may have done, they have done so much bad and the church is still being dishonest about it. And so I said, what can I do? 
I can't be dishonest and it's for my own sake, my own personal experience, going to church is lying to myself at that point. And I'm, I was so done with this honesty that I was like, I'm not going to lie to myself. I'm not going to sit here lying to myself and being dishonest saying, Hey, go to church and just get through this. And the church is true and X, Y, Z. And so I told her and I said, I, I'm not, I can't go anymore. And I could tell it crushed her. I'm then it was hard. And I'm throwing my garments away and saying, I can't go to the temple. I, I can't support a lot of what this church does. It doesn't mean I'm done with the church. I just, I just need a break. Um, and at that point, um, we were already struggling because of my career, because I was away from the family a lot doing this rigorous program from 8 a.m. to 11 p.m. at night constantly. And um, and I just remember knowing, and, and I'm sure she did too, knowing in the back of my mind that if that's all we have in common, I don't know if this will or even should continue just because, and it should, and now I look back and I go, yeah, you should not be with someone just because a church says never ever get divorced because then you make more pain. And with those children, we had to weigh in that. It's like, are we, is this happy for them? Did they see the discord? I know that. I was a part of that in my childhood. And regardless of the pain and heartache that I went through, I now look back at my parents and I go, they needed to split. Regardless of how much they loved each other, there was abuse, there was things going on on both sides that needed to stop. And they just weren't healthy in that relationship anymore. And that narrative in the church is never get divorced no matter what. And personally, I didn't, as a, as a kid or as uh, in my marriage, I didn't experience this huge amount of abuse from my partner or any in, anything in that marriage. But there are people that do. There are people that stay in marriages that are abusive and physically and physically abusive, emotionally abusive, manipulative, and they're in these toxic, toxic, toxic conditions. But why aren't they leaving? Because the narrative, they're conditioned not to. They're conditioned. Families are forever. Families are forever. And so that was a huge, regardless of our other problems that we have had, that was a big one. And once I left, we drifted. And uh, um, we, I remember her coming to me. I remember the night and it, it was hard for both of us, but she, she opened up and just said that she couldn't do it anymore. And we both knew it. We were at that point, I think, I, I know I was in the denial process of no, 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 no. Even though in my mind, I was like, this, this can't keep working. Um, it's getting unhealthy because we're both on different pages and we have nothing in common other than gospel on our kids. And, and so I remember just breaking down because I had failed. And it's a, and that's a true thing when, when you are, a child of a divorced family and then you realize that you've done the same thing to your children and i know i've worked through i'm still working through forgiving myself and and not having that shame talk but when you realize that that is what you've done it it broke me and um and i know her intentions were great, and I know that, and I don't blame her for saying this, but she said that she she basically said, if I told myself I would never divorce unless they left the church or I was cheated on, and I left. And I don't blame her for that because I know that's not her narrative. I know that is a conditioned narrative that I was taught. And that was my goal until I left. I knew that once marriage was marriage and you'd never ever divorce. And unless, you know, you can justify it, you start justifying it if they are leaving because it's like, 
threatening your eternal salvation of your whole family. And so, yeah, leave and get, get help. <laughs> but, uh, and so I remember no, hearing that and man, the shame, it was hard. And that's why going back to that comment, to uh, uh, that comment saying, Hey, the church brings happiness. Why are you, why are you focusing on this? Because there is damage. There's so much damage. There is so much damage that members are not seen, that are conditioned into your lifestyle, that when you step outside of that bubble and you realize, and, and that's the other thing, once you step out, you can't look at it again in the same light because you know that's what knowledge is. You know. And once you step outside, that bubble and you see the harm we're gonna speak out we're gonna say no this is wrong hey you're teaching this narrative this is wrong and if they disagree say well you're being gaslit because that's the church that's what they do unfortunately regardless of the good that they do and now i'm in a place where i know that it was it was important for us to split our and i remember going when i got divorced it will separate my life was spiraling. Um, and I remember going to my class and my professor, my acting professor, who was a very strict, very hard professor. She was the hardest there. She just, you, if you pass her, you passed her lessons in her classes, you gave yourself a pat on the back. Uh, I should say without crying sometimes because she was just, she made you push those boundaries. And I remember she knew that I was separated and I remember sitting there in class and she very delicately said, she said, you know, I hate the, and, and she would get soft-spoken and, and get really real, which I always appreciated. And she said, I hate the narrative. And she wasn't Mormon. I hate the narrative that, uh, or the, the word divorce or our relationship, we split, we ended the relationship. Um, we separated because X, Y, Z. She was, and she looked at me and she said, your relationship was fulfilled, Mitch. And we should start looking at that with relationships. Some relationships get fulfilled to the point where it's no longer healthy or even a, a, an advantage to continue to go, especially if it's against your own personal health. And instead of shaming us, shaming people we should say you know what first of all i'm not in their shoes and second of all that's what relationships are we find people who we connect with and we and we love and we experience life with and then there gets a point where it's fulfilled sometimes and then we move on and it shouldn't be shamed in our society and especially in religion it's very prominent in religion to shame divorce or um ending a marriage or separating or anything like that. And so when she, uh, I kind of went off there, but when she said that, that hit home so hard because it helped me heal and go, regardless of the mistakes I know I made in that marriage, um, I know that that relationship was fulfilled and that I, instead of shaming myself, I can now step forward. And I personally believe because I have stepped out of the church, I am in a more healthy, place to do this and to step forward and be there for my kids as much as I can to love them, to teach them what I know is right, regardless of my, uh, my ex-wife and her new husband are in the church. They're very strong. Um, and so that's why I still have a good relationship with the church because I have kids in the church and I'm learning to empathize again on the other side now that I'm out and to go, okay, I can see why you think that. And, uh, and so it's a, it's a delicate process, but that, that is why the church harms and, and, uh, those narratives have to stop. And that's one of many, there's so many harmful narratives. So many. Speaking of that, I'm sure you're going to get, uh, I'm sure you've already gotten a couple different types of, reactions i'm gonna i'm gonna give you the kind of offensive stereotypical reaction then give you a chance to just respond to it directly 
So if someone says to you, Mitch, you brought it on yourself, you, you left the church and your marriage fell apart. Like you, you broke your covenants. Basically, if you had stayed true to your covenants, your marriage would still be intact and you wouldn't have had to go through a divorce. You know, it's really on you for breaking your covenants. If somebody were to say that to you, what would be your compassionate but earnest response? Well, first of all, I guess where I'm at now, I'd probably turn on my Holland and just say, why? Shame on you. And just dig into them uh, as, with humor. Um, but some <laughs> of that's true. Some it's, it's flipping the flipping it around to say, Hey, you're, you guys do this. So let me show you how it feels. But um, empathetically, it would honestly be hard because I heard that narrative and it was extremely difficult because that honestly, that narrative is based in shame of like, you did this, you did X, Y, Z to your family. You, you broke your covenants. Um, my empathetic response that, that I would give would be, Regardless, I guess, regardless of our experiences, first of all, as I've said, we need to put ourselves in other people's shoes. But people make mistakes. And where I'm at now, I can see why you think that because I've thought that way. I went through that. And please just be aware that those kind of responses can be extremely hurtful, extremely hurtful. But again, I understand where you're coming from because I use those same words to other people, not maybe in the exact same way. And well, I think why is it not, that, that's so, beautiful. Why is it not true? Why is it, why is it not a fair summary of of you and your decisions to simply write you off as a covenant breaker? Why is, how would you say, no, 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 let me, let me give you a quick summary for what really did happen. Mm -hmm. Calling me a covenant breaker doesn't capture it. And here's why. Yeah. For simply because someone, if you're called a covenant breaker, which I, that was one of the things. So that's a very true comment. A covenant, regardless of where I am. So I, where I'm at now is I don't believe that I have broken those covenants. I didn't, I didn't cheat on my wife. I didn't, I didn't uh, do things. I, the only covenant in the ch church that I broke was step away. But even then I didn't, I didn't, leave the church when we were married, I said I needed a break. And the thing that the shame-based comment, because it's shameful in that way, or uh, even if members, and that's why I empathize with them as well, because a lot of the times they are coming from a very sincere place. And so it's easy for us as ex-Mormons to go, how dare you? You're a, you're a piece of crap. How dare you say that to me? Um, and I'm guilty of it. I mean, I used Holland on a few of my commenters, but they are coming. They're honestly wanting to know. And so I would say, hey, if you have questions, I'll tell you my honest answers. If you're honestly willing to listen, I didn't break any covenants. I didn't cheat on my wife. Um, I, what my wife and I decided, first of all, is our business and was for the betterment of our family. And if you don't agree with that, that's okay, but you can talk to me about my experience and I will tell you openly what my experience was and why I personally decided that it was healthy, healthier to leave than to stay. And those aren't breaking covenants, that's being true to yourself, that's being honest. And you might go as far to say that dishonesty can also break covenants. And so it's, it becomes a paradox when you stay in a marriage, when you're honestly knowing that you shouldn't be there, especially if there's abuse, you're being dishonest. And so why would you, 
that to me is breaking if you go as far to say the temple covenants and not being honest then yeah but I, I don't know if that's what you were <laughs> getting at. yeah no that's perfect and, and it's beautiful and it, so if you had to summarize why you stopped attending and and eventually left the church what would be your kind of one to two minute summary of, of why you left why you stopped believing Um, I've touched on this, but I remember when I, when I finally decided to stop, I just finally decided because I still flirted, I would still go back to church and try and it would be painful. And I remember having experiences being triggered with spiritual experiences that I needed to stay. Um, but I remember thinking to myself, I am not being honest with myself right now. I am convincing myself that something I know is wrong now is right. Again, regardless of what good this organization does, I was starting to see a bigger picture of what harm it does and that it I couldn't be a part of it. I couldn't go to church and affiliate with something that spreads homophobia and sexism and and uh, bigotry and hate disguised as love. And a lot of members might hear that and be so flabbergasted, but that is what is happening. And when you get to that point, when I got to that point, I going to church was dishonest. Going to church went against everything that felt right to me. And again, it's easier to go. It's easier to go. It's easier to just turn on, turn off those concerns and go and take the sacrament and just keep on keeping on. And it was the hardest decision I ever made to finally stop. And it's still extremely hard, still extremely hard. But I have gone through so much personal growth because my independence is blossoming. I am not worried about what... Uh, a prophet says anymore to guilt me. Um, I'm being true to myself, and that's regardless. Take away the Mormon Church, whether whatever religion I have left, if I left another religion or an organization, I think the more the the most important thing for anyone is to stay true to yourself. Is exactly what when my buddy told me when I was going through it. Stay true. Follow your heart. Don't don't look. Don't disregard your conscience. Don't disregard the spirit, if, if that's a better way to say it. And continue to follow that path because your heart won't. Cheesy, cheesy, cheesy. But your heart will not lead you astray in that. Your conscience will not lead you. You know what's right. And when you use your logical thinking and your heart and your mind together as one and start pursuing that it's it, it's gonna lead to wonderful places it has for me so you know for for as many people as i've talked to about their loss of faith and leaving the church it's rare that i've thought about it as a as a matter of integrity you know people talk about i, I was expecting you to say joseph smith polygamy polyandry book of abraham book of mormon historicity and then occasionally it's like oh i converted to you know, regular Christianity, or now I'm an evangelical, but rarely have I had people frame it, or at least in my mind, do I remember it as being framed literally as a matter of integrity mm -hmm. where you, it was dishonest for you to remain in the church. Uh, and so you had to leave because talk about keeping your covenants. <laughs> if, if you believe in God, if you believe in Jesus, or if you've covenanted, or if you've just believed in the principle, let's say you don't believe in God and Jesus like you used to, uh -huh. if you just truly internalize the value of honesty and of integrity and of being true and of mm -hmm. and of loving truth, if it if it feels like it's untrue, if you arrive at the point where you're convinced that it's not uh, an ethical thing for you to continue participating in something that you feel to your very core is either harmful mm -hmm. or just untrue or wrong, then what a beautiful answer to be able to say, I left as a matter of integrity. 
in some ways you're keeping your covenants by leaving. I guess, I guess that's true. <laughs> that's a good way to, to phrase it. Yeah. It's, um, and, and personal growth. I think, um, a lot of people stay, um, will want to stay in the church because they have that idea that if you leave, you're, you're, you're not going to be a good person. What are you without the church? Ballard, where will you go if you, if you leave? It's that narrative of like, no, no, you be true to yourself, your integrity, follow that. If, if it, if it is, and I'll say what Wynn said to me, which is so true. If it does lead you to stay in the church, be true to yourself, follow that integrity. If it leads you out, don't be afraid to leave, follow that integrity to be a better person, be your best self, because we know ourselves the best. And if, if, uh, if something's ticking in your mind and heart to say, I can't, I can't be my truest self here, regardless if it's religion or relationship or anything, start following the path that will bring you to your truest, most independent self. And that's where you, I mean, at least for me, I'm still learning, but I'm learning a lot about myself out of the church and it's wonderful and it's scary, but it's, it's life. This is what this is what life is, and it's it can be a very beautiful, beautiful thing once you break out, for lack of a better term. But I love it. So uh, lo lots of uh, lots of beautiful comments from our our viewers and listeners. Kellerin writes, Mormon Stories podcast, that's so interesting for me. Leaving the church was 100% a matter of integrity. It's dishonest for me to stay was exactly mm -hmm. how I felt. That's Kellerin. Mm -hmm. um, my dear friend, Allison. Hey, Allison. Allison writes, that's exactly what made me leave. I had to have my integrity. Truth matters to me. Solidarity, Mitch. Um, Sammy writes, uh, OMG, I love him. He's so funny. Uh, <laughs> Tamara writes, that is what happened to me. I feel I felt like a fraud going to church. Once I knew that it wasn't true, yep. I couldn't stay. You, uh, just you a lot of me twos. Jordan Wilcox writes, integrity demanded my impart departure. The church is everything the prophets warn us about. Uh, wolves in sheep's clothing. Oh, wow. Yep. Let me, let me, I'm going to say this with a different intonation. Jordan says, the church is everything the prophets warn us about. Wolves in sheep's clothing, lies of omission, selling signs and tokens for money. You can buy anything in this world with money, hidden in plain sight. That post makes clear what I've never seen. The church, oh, wow. So Jordan's feeling very strongly. Jordan says, the church is an abomination to God for me. It is a hijacker of this mortal existence. The only thing we know is real with the promise of what we can't know is real. Wow. Very, very powerful and profound. Uh Words. Uh, thank you, Jordan. Do you have any response to, to those? Yeah, uh, that's that's exactly what I felt. Uh, I love that when you when you basically, for me and for all these other ex members, when you continue to go to church, you have that feeling that you're a fraud as well. That if you continue this narrative, which is ironic because the true the one of the things that the, che that the church teaches that is good is integrity and honesty, and ironically, that is what led me out. That is what I said. This isn't right. I was taught that my whole life, and staying made me feel like I was contributing to the narrative, and I couldn't. And some people do stay, and I admire that. I just couldn't. I just couldn't do it. Um, and that's not me saying, hey, if you if you know the church, that there's wrong in the church and you stay, then you're not true to your integrity. No, that's wonderful. If you feel yet like your integrity is to make a change in the church, that's beautiful. Keep doing it. But for those of us who have decided to leave because of that, it, it's simply that. If it's a fraud and I go to that corporation and support it, I'm supporting a fraud. I'm a fraud myself. It might sound extreme, but... That's that's a good way to put it. Um, another stereotype people might uh, foist on you is, well, yeah, you're an actor. You became an actor. You chose the acting profession. So, you know, you, you chose a profession that's going to lead you out of the church. Oh, yeah. Uh, that's on you. They, I think you've already answered this, but if there's anything else you would want to say on top of some sort of accusation like that, 
that somehow you chose a dishonorable profession that would lead to the loss of faith, what would your response to that be? Honestly, I would just say, regard, uh, um, aside from what I've already said, I personally believe that art is at our core. Um, I personally believe that religion is a form of art, storytelling, to inspire us to do better. And we, as artists, um, basically, we are tapping into that, into what religion's true purpose, in my mind, is and changing. It's all humanity progresses. We evolve, we change. And um, the purpose of religion, used wrong in the wrong way, is to put walls around that change. And it's, you look at the history of theater and art, it's, it's all over. Every time a religious, uh, a religiously dominated government would be at the center and uh, tell people what to do and what not to do, the arts were there pushing for change. And it's always going to be the case. And so I'm, you can tell I'm passionate about this because I am an artist, but art is one of the most fundamental, and I think it should be more recognized in our society. Um, and so as I guess you could say, I'm more true to, I believe, more true to following uh, God and and I personally don't believe in God anymore, but God in a sense of a higher self, a higher humanity. Because I believe that's what God is. So I am, in a way, still religious, but not traditionally. Not traditionally at all. <laughs> right. So. Thank you. And, and I love it. it. And ironically, I would say to that comment that, that, you know, whether it's Saturday's Warrior or My Turn on Earth or Legacy, mm -hmm. yeah, the church is really, you know, all the heart cell stuff, all those commercials over the years, the church was super eager and continues to be mm -hmm. super eager and uh, bold in embracing actors and music and art and music and the spoken word and the Mormon Tabernacle Choir. The church will embrace art when it sells people into uh, membership or into continued membership. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you can't have it both ways. You can't rely so heavily on emotional manipulation, on acting, on music, on, on pulling people's heartstrings mm -hmm. to indoctrinate them to stay in. And then all of a sudden, like turn your nose up at artists and art when there are them in a right. different direction than the church kind of. Points that's them in. Very, very good point. That's that's valid. Yeah, that's, that's very true. <laughs> this is kind of fun. I have a friend from, so I, those of you who know me, I went to Katy High School, which is a suburb of Houston, Texas. Mm -hmm. um, and one of the, one of the friends in my graduating class, his name is Maurice Ball. He was a, a, a person of color uh, growing up in, in Katy, Texas. We would have gone to high school together between mm -hmm. 84 and 87. Uh, Maurice has, has never been Mormon, but I didn't know Maurice, Maurice, you listen to Mormon stories, but I totally remember you. That's awesome. And Maurice writes, Maurice Ball writes, John, you and I grew up together in Katy. I did not grow up Mormon. However, I did grow up in the black church and I see so many parallels with how the church pressured me, particularly as a gay black man. Thank you, Mitch, for your words and to John for this program. Uh, Maurice, it'd be fun to have you on Mormon stories sometime. I love my non never Mormon listeners. I love the fact that I have ex, you know, that I have Catholics and Episcopalians and Baptists and Jews and Muslims and, and uh, Scientologists and Jehovah's witnesses or X, all of those religions, evangelicals. I love it uh, that I have never Mormons who, who enjoy Mormon stories. So thank you, Maurice, for sharing uh, that comment. It's great to hear from you. It's been a long time. It's been, 35 years, <laughs> you know, 33 years since, since, uh, I saw you guys, uh, saw you Maurice, but it's so fun to have you tune in and a shout out just to all our never Mormon listeners. Um, how does it feel Mitch to know that your work might inspire people who have never even been Mormon? Honestly, it, it feels wonderful. I love, uh, <laughs> 
the most part it's humor and um and i ever since a kid i've always if i can spread joy that's i think that's awesome and so um but the the thing is is what maurice was also saying is i i believe that there are themes and that's why another reason why the mormon church has um turned me off uh, eventually completely like i didn't want anything to do with that or any other religion personally because i believe that re religion withholds us from actually being our truest selves to a point it doesn't mean it's all bad it just means for me personally religion and society have these themes and traditions that we're always told to do always told to do and i think my videos and uh creating this content reaches people even who haven't been mormon because it's it's not only they might go it's my my church did or i just i was in a relationship like that um these themes i'm finding and discovering as we all are are very common in our society so so let me ask you uh just some questions about uh genie man now if it's okay yeah of course um, so so you know, TikTok is a new medium. It's it's probably emerged what late last year, early this year, and it's. I, I think so. I I just got on it. So. <laughs> yeah. When um, when was your first video? When did you post your first video? How long ago? I think it was about a, a little over a month ago in August. Only August. a month. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So so for those who don't know TikTok, so that you know, there's we've got Twitter, we've got Facebook, we've got Instagram. Instagram's photos. Pinterest is photos, uh, Facebook, you know, is, is text, but also photos. And now it's video. Um, you know, YouTube is, is, is videos as well. TikTok is super short videos. Mm -hmm. So what's the, what's the maximum length of a TikTok video? Do you know, Mitch? Yep. 59 seconds. So one under a minute. So super short up until now, a lot of TikTok has just been like people doing silly little dances, mimicking other people dancing, people singing or or uh, pantomiming to to music it's it's been a lot of silliness my brother Joel started a little vegan channel where he started sharing veganism and vegan recipes but it's it's quick it's short it's punchy and it's it's uh it's a really interesting medium but it's mm -hmm. it's one of the most popular mediums in the world right now especially amongst youth and and young adults but also adults you can just sit there for long, long periods of time, yeah, just flipping yeah. through short videos, right? Yeah. And so I guess my first, so I want to talk about your choices as an activist because you are an activist. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you're, you're jumping right in there now with, with Kate Kelly, with Jeremy Runnels, with Bill Real, with Radio Free Mormon, with me, with Lindsay Anson Park, with, you know, with all the players, because your, your videos are getting shared regularly on ex Mormon Reddit and mm -hmm. uh, I'm sure your viewers are growing. How many viewers do you have right now? How many oh, followers or followers? You know? I think it's close to 2,000. So about 2,000. We'll see if it grows after today. Um, hope it does. Uh, please, yeah. please, you know, if you want to, if you still can, download TikTok, uh, uh, search for Genie Man, G E N I E underscore man, and uh, follow him. Let's see if we could double or triple his followers. That'd be super cool. Thank you. Um, so first question is what made you choose TikTok as your medium versus YouTube or Facebook or other things? Well, uh, it, my brother had told me uh, a while ago because he he had TikTok and I, I didn't know what the heck it was, but he was like, Mitch, um, we should make videos. They're one minute videos, but it would be a lot of fun to just make these people are making these short videos on TikTok. And, and so I watched a few and they were pretty funny and I was like, yeah, okay. But it didn't really catch me. Um, and then the reason I started is because I finally got TikTok to see what all the hype was about. And I found the ex-Mormon community. Wonderful community. And I was like, this is awesome. People are speaking out about the church. People are sharing their experiences. I love this. And so for a while, I was just viewing. It brought a lot of uh, healing to view. And then that thought popped in my head. You know, I... I have these impressions of these uh, leaders that I should start uh, throwing out. And then one thing led to another and I started. And the reason I went to TikTok, and I know this is gonna, <laughs> the reason I went to TikTok is because I don't know if Facebook or Instagram would have uh, liked what I did. 
because I have so many friends and family that are still Mormon. And uh, what I wanted to do um, was cater to an audience who un understood exactly what I was saying, not just the impressions, but the, the honesty, the dishonesty, the deceit and doing it in an ironic way. Um, and I didn't even know about Reddit ex Mormon. I, I mean, I'd heard of it, but it was my, <clears throat> it was my cousin, um, Derek, who had, he said, dude, you should, you should post these on ex Mormon Reddit. So, so you didn't, so prior to, to doing TikTok, you weren't really into ex Mormon Reddit at all. Nope. I would say that my, it's probably the biggest forum for progressive and post Mormonism in the world. I, mean, I would read a few things on there, but I, I the Reddit wasn't, I wasn't familiar with it, familiar with it much. I, I Facebook, my, my place was um, Facebook, your page, Mormon stories. Um, and, uh, Utah Valley post Mormons, um, and other pages where I would, that's where I would get a lot of my, and so I, I didn't even think I could have posted there as well. Um, but I think in the moment I was just, I started getting involved with TikTok, and I was like, I'll just, just do it here. So, so your main influences as a progressive and post Mormon were CES letter. What other, what other, what other people or social media or content were, were influences for you? I'm just curious. Oh, man. So, uh, CES letter, um, there was, uh, uh, obviously my, my two, um, close friends, Eileen and Trevor McIntosh, friends and family like that. Um, who encouraged me and were there for me. Um, Mormon Stories podcast, when uh, I think Trevor actually introduced me to that as well when I started take, stepping out. Um, I started listening to a lot of uh, episodes on here, and it was so freeing. Um, there are, there was, are there particular interviewees that really touched you or that, that – and if you don't remember their names or – but but is there? Do you remember any episodes that were meaningful to you? Just as shout outs to the people that told their stories. Um, let's see. When I first, a lot of it, to be honest, was what what uh, I heard at that time when I was leaving back in two thousand sixteen and seventeen. Um, was basically what hit home with me were the the ones that talked about that kind of the fraud. Uh, being true to yourself, integrity, and there, and like you said, there wasn't a, a lot, but um, I was also really invested in the church historian. Didn't you have a church historian? Is that Dan right? Bogle, maybe? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I I got really fascinated with that because um, once I read the CES letter, I wanted to dive in more, and so listening to any uh, podcast of yours that dove more into the church actual history of the church. So I really enjoyed the one with the, um, uh, church historian. Um, and I know you had, uh, Sam, Sam Young. Yeah, sure. He, he was, um, a huge, uh, once I started stepping into the church, he was a huge influence on, on bringing awareness to interviews of, uh, children and child abuse in the church. Um, and, uh, and then there was another podcast. I listened to it right as I was leaving, and I, I listened to a handful of episodes. Um, but it was, uh, I believe it was, I can't remember the name of the podcast. It basically, um, it, she would talk about, she started, it, it's all about Joseph Smith's wives, and maybe the viewers can help me out. So that's, all, that's Year of Polygamy podcast with Lindsay. Year of, thank you. Thank you. Yes, I started listening to that, and that fascinated me a lot. Um, because even when I was still in the church, I wanted to know what the actual history was. And so I listened to, there was a time when I was uh, going through my transition where I listened to those as well. Um, Trevor uh, and Adam Worthington made a video called 50 Problems with the Mormon Church. Um, Trevor, my good friend uh, from childhood, he, he and Adam made that video. I didn't know what it was when I was Mormon, but once I got that, I watch that. And that was amazing. Um, that helped me a ton because it just basically condensed so much, um, of what the problems with the LES church are. Um, and, uh, yeah, um, there have been ex Mormonism or ex Mormonology 
I think is another one I've been listening to. And uh, she gave me a lot of uh, new perspective on working through the trauma because it's easy for us to hang on to that anger. And she talks a lot about how we can take a breath and, um, and when someone makes a comment, a shameful comment, um, instead of attacking back, we can just acknowledge that words were spoken and understand that they're coming from their point of view and they're not, rarely it's intended to hurt. It's, it's, and so that's, that's helped me a lot. Um, my brothers left, my, one of my younger brothers left before me. He was a huge help. Um, my mom is one of my biggest heroes. She left after, but she has, she's always been there. Even while I was going through it, she was one of the only ones that would sit down and just listen to me, regardless if she was a believing member or not. Um, she just listened. And I feel incredibly lucky. I know there are not a lot of people whose um, parents, any of their parents had left. Um, but my mom left as well. She's not going. And so I talked to her a lot about what I'm struggling with with the church and she listens and talks back but yeah those are just a few I've there's a lot a lot yeah so I'm um, a shout out to the Mormon informant YouTube channel those guys do great work oh yeah and, oh yeah and some of those videos uh, I just realized had over a million a mm -hmm. million views so if you haven't checked out uh, the Mormon informant YouTube channel, uh, they only have 8.4 thousand subscribers, which is a lot, but, a lot. uh, they could use a lot more, but, but one of their videos, 50 problems with the Mormon church mm -hmm. has over a million views. And I can just tell you also married as someone who's been doing YouTube for a long time, I've, I've never, I've never released a video that has a million views. I have, I released videos with hundreds of thousands of views, but, but not, not millions. So mm -hmm. So yeah. those guys have done done really good work, and uh, so he and Trevor gave me the CES letter, and he also introduced me. I didn't know it was him. I actually, funny story, I watched that video even before I knew Trevor. My my childhood friend had made it, <laughs> and so he when I told him, he was like, uh, "Yeah, we made that," and I was like, "What? That's awesome!" Yeah. But, so shout out to Adam and Trevor, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yep. So my next question for you is. Um, I've got about, and I've got about 20 minutes left. I've been keeping you longer than I told you I would, but I moved an appointment because I, I wanted to not rush it. Um, you're, uh, I mean, you're clearly gifted and talented. Do you want to tell everyone just kind of what you do? Like if they want to follow you, uh, Allison asked earlier if, uh, if you can be rented out for parties. <laughs> um, let's see if I can. Yeah. So Allison writes, I keep asking this on your TikTok. <laughs> But can we rent you out for parties? Uh, uh, how do people, can, if people want to support your day job, your art, like, can they go down to St. George and see you in plays or musicals? Oh, Is geez. there any way? Right now, no. There's a lot of theaters um, aren't going on because of uh, COVID. So right now I actually work as a youth mentor up in Hurricane, um, which is nearby St. George. Um but I'm trying to get creative. TikTok was my first kind of step to get creative with uh, my impressions and acting. Um, and I'm, I'm wanting to do more, but uh, right now, as of now, there's not like any, any uh, events going on, um, but I'm willing to do work uh, with people want me. I'm happy and open to do work. Um, and Trevor just, my friend Trevor just said, he, he was like, you, you should, Mitch, I would pay money for you to crack jokes as uh, LDS leaders at the at their expense like this. So he was basically saying you should look into this more. So this is kind of new for me. I'm very new at this. Um, I, I'm i still learning. So unfortunately, right now, I don't have anything but TikTok and ex-Mormon Reddit. <laughs> um, one of our listeners, it's Tamara Tanner Donathorn. Yes. It, yes. It looks Hi, like, is she your cousin? Yeah. Uh huh. So she says, Hey, cuz your mom is incredible. I love her. Mm -hmm. So it's fun to have your family showing up. Yes. Yeah, um, on here. Amazing. It's, it sounds like the biggest thing people can do to support you is share your videos. Exactly. Yeah. Share my videos. Um, if subscribe you know to your channel. Yeah. If you know, an part, event, 
Mm. And comment. My brother told me that commenting on TikTok helps with the algorithms quite a bit. Yeah, that, that is true. Uh-huh. Yeah. So go on TikTok, like his channel, heart or like his posts, comment on them, and that's that's helpful. Yes. And if you have, if I'm, I'm also interested in voice work. Uh, if you know of anyone that is looking for any any actors or voice actors, just. Oh, yeah, that's great. References is, is what I'm all about right now. I'm just, I'm, I'm a new actor, even though I've been studying it for a while. I'm starting to put my foot out there. So any help would be so awesome to get, to keep going in that avenue. All right. So shout out to anyone who needs, uh, who needs talents like those Mitch provides. Let's, let's get him hired. Um, let's get him supported. Somebody is saying, Derek says, be sure to look into the TikTok creators fund. I don't know what that is, but okay. that's a suggestion from Derek. Um, Lewis says you should try Cameo or Fiverr. I have no idea what that is, but I've heard of Fiverr, but I haven't heard of Cameo. Um, let me ask you one, you know, I want to show a couple more videos to close. Um, your, you know, your, there are different levels of like tone or severity that you can choose. Mm -hmm. And I would say your videos go right for the jugular in some ways. They're can I kind of not say for work They're Um, they're kind you know, and you come across as very mild and thoughtful. You're not coming across as like strident or angry. And when I say angry, I mean like an angry person. Uh, anger okay. is healthy. We all should be angry at having been misled and, and, uh, you know, intentionally deceived uh, and to have our lives kind of uh, thrown upside down. So anger's fine. We should all embrace our anger. We should also act responsibly mm -hmm. with, with the anger and, and process it and heal and not get stuck in the anger. Having said all that, your, yeah. your, your personality is very mild and thoughtful, but the videos, you know, you watch that and I'm like, well, I wonder what this guy's like in real life because this is like really – this is kind of hardcore stuff, right? This is, yeah. uh -huh. this is going for the jugular. That's a, that's kind of a tone or a style choice. And honestly, mm -hmm. there's a bit of a mismatch between the demeanor that comes across knowing you and mm -hmm. kind of what I would guess your demeanor would be like with such kind of hard edged videos. Yeah. Can you talk about that choice of, of, you know, going for R rated versus PG 13 versus PG versus G yeah. As an activist, and, and you're new to this, so mm -hmm. I don't even know to what extent you have enough experience to have really contemplated this. But, you know, with Mormon yeah. stories, it's always like, do I come off as a believer? Do I come off as kind? Do I try and stay objective? Do I get angry? Do I, you know, there's always this tone policing that you do to yourself as an activist and other people do to you. Can mm -hmm. you talk just about that choice to be yeah. kind of hard? hard edged. Um, I mean, honestly, that's what, uh, old me would have been like, no, um, you need to keep it mild. Um, but a lot of times even serious content, um, requires you to push those boundaries. Like I've, I've talked about and my decision to say, you know what? No, screw it. Um, my whole life, as an actor, as wanting to be an actor or in the arts, I've always, um, because I was raised LDS, I've always looked for like the more mild or, you know, the, the clean humor. And I am now an advocate. I love clean humor. I love that as well. Um, it can be really, really good and helpful and funny. But on the other side, um, I'm now an advocate because it makes you uncomfortable. And I myself, one of my decisions was um, I'm uncomfortable with this. I should do it. <laughs> and that's not a good lesson. I'm not saying you should do something just because you're uncomfortable with it. Of course, I looked into the why, but having the years that I did at USU and, and learning about art and the purpose of it is to push those boundaries. I believe that you need, you need to tackle serious things we often shy away from it. We often shy away from tackling, saying the things that really cause us to think. Um, and that's 
dark humor as well. It's that's a very fine line for me too. Some dark humor I love, some dark humor I'm I'm still like that cross line. <laughs> but I think it's so important for us um, and for you know for myself um, and my own personal growth, I guess as an actor, is to to push those boundaries for myself. I um, I mentioned that I was. I still get triggered when I, I, I go and rewatch some of these conference talks, which on a good day, it doesn't bother me at all. And on a bad day, I get really triggered and have to take a break. Um, but one of the reasons I decided to really do this is because of that narrative that my conditioned narrative is you don't, you don't joke about the men of God, even if the jokes are fine. You don't, you know, that's a fine line to walk as a Mormon. Um, and so it's to help me <laughs> to get past that barrier and say, you know what? No, I know deep down that I'm not, uh, going to hell for, for this. And also I know that just like this is therapeutic for me, this is therapeutic for other ex members and members who are on the fence to be able to see, to be able to laugh at something especially ex-Mormons, laugh at something that, that has caused so much pain. And a lot of people, there are members that get on my TikTok that don't understand that. They're like, you, they say that narrative, um, you, you're, you're going to hell or you, you're fighting against the men of God, be careful. And, uh, and that's it's something that they won't understand until they put themselves in our shoes and try to understand that the, what we've talked about, John, the harm, the pain, the abuse that's gone on. And so um, my decision was because of those, those points is to help, help others, help myself get through this trauma that I still experience. And honestly, getting, getting through some of those and uh, making jokes at the expense of the leaders had been hard. There have been some times where I haven't posted that I won't think I won't post, but I work through it. Say no, this is this is needed. This I need to I need to paint these people that are held up in a light that are so revered and with humor say, hey, these people aren't exactly who you think they are and who they try to feed you that they are or the narrative of the history of the church and. Uh, yeah, an act, an activist and fighting for that. So, yeah, I'm going to do something that's kind of uh, kind of intense, but I'm going to share a comment of a critic, Tom Robinson, who uh, who has a Facebook. No, it's a YouTube uh, handle. Tom Robinson, all things mm -hmm. real estate. He writes, "Those TikTok videos are disgusting and very disrespectful to those individuals. I'm not sure why they are being praised or promoted." So I'll answer, I'll answer that. And then uh, Tom Robinson, I'll answer that. And then I'll give you a chance as well to chime in, Mitch. And this is going to be repeating a lot of what you just said. But, mm. you know, if you study cults, if you study harmful cults, Stephen Hassan has a book um, about, two books about cults, actually three. And they're really important. Uh, Combating Cult Mind Control is his first book. And what he, what he gives us is an acronym called the BITE model, B-I-T-E, BITE. And what you learn, and you learn if you study Waco and David Koresh, if you study Scientology and L. Ron Hubbard or David Miscavige, if you study the Jehovah's Witnesses, if you study, you know, super Orthodox Judaism, any cult, right? Pick any cult. What you'll find out is they control people's behavior. Don't look at things. Don't read things. Wear this. Don't wear that. Eat this. Don't eat that. Touch yourself here. Don't touch yourself there. Here's how mm -hmm. you should be sexually. Here's not how you should be sexually. They control the information that you receive. Um, in other words, don't read that. Only read Mormon approved resources. Stay away from anti-Mormon resources. Excommunicate John Nolan. Don't watch his stuff because it's bad. So th they do all that to control the information that you receive so that T, thoughts, they can control your thoughts. They don't want you thinking just like Mitch, you shared a couple of years ago. I can't yeah. go there. I'm not going to think about that. I won't read this. I won't read that. Oh, there's a babysitter. Don't look into the babysitter. Uh, you know, 
that if, if somebody says don't look into the babysitter, that's your number one concern yeah. that you should look into the babysitter, right? Mm -hmm. Uh and, and it's true of churches. The church that says don't look into our history is the church you should run from. And, mm -hmm. and so the church controls your thoughts. Um, they control the information so they can keep you from having thoughts about, huh, could this be true? Is it really like they said? Is Was Joseph Smith just persecuted because he was a, a loving, loved Jesus? Or maybe was there actually something to why Joseph was persecuted, right? Is Sam yeah. Young... Is Sam Young just a bad guy or are there children that are being sexually abused in the church and the church is covering it up? Oh, stay away. Don't look at that stuff. Excommunicate him. He's an apostate. That's bad. These are mm. all maneuvers that cults make to control people. And then the E in the bite model is emotion. They want you to feel reverence for the church, that the church is inspired, that the church is of God, that the church is holy. And then they want you to feel fear and sadness and, and afraid to ever speak ill of the Lord's anointed or, or to speak ill of the church or to violate the, the veil or this veneer of sacredness. And mm -hmm. it's so hard because I get it. I was Mormon. I, I thought the temple was sacred. I thought general conference was sacred. I thought the brethren were sacred. And I get why you're asking this question, Mr. Robinson. But my response is that's part of how they control you. When they tell you these men are of God and Jesus is sacred and God is sacred and the temple is sacred, don't talk about it and certainly never criticize it. That That's like an armor of protection so that you can't see it for what it really is. It's mind control. It's thought control and it's emotional manipulation. Mm -hmm. And so it's not like, I love being sacrilegious. I love mocking people's sacred beliefs. That's not what the, 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 I can speak for me. That's not, that's not who I am. I love Mormons. I, I am fond of the Mormon church, but the extent to which we cower in the church's requirement of holding things sacred and not talking about things and all oh, the leaders are sacred and don't make fun of them and don't laugh loudly and don't tap too much into your emotions. Don't learn too much. Don't think too much. Don't talk too much. That's all part of how they create this impenetrable bubble that makes it so people can't see things for what they really are. That's why 150 plus years into the restoration, most Mormons don't know Joseph used a peepstone. They don't know that he was a treasure digger. They don't know that he admitted that he was a fraud. They don't know that everything he did with the Book of Mormon was, was a reaction to his treasure digging. They don't know that the witnesses were all, uh, were all superstitious, gullible people. They don't mm -hmm. know that Joseph Smith was having adultery before he was calling it polygamy. They mm -hmm. don't know that, you know, the first witnesses disagreed with Joseph and called him a fallen prophet. They don't know that he was lying to Emma, that he had 30 plus wives, that he, uh, that he was lying to Emma about all his affairs, that he was sleeping with 14 or 15 or 16 year olds, marrying other men's wives, sending them on missions so he could proposition their wives. They don't know all the problems with the Book of Mormon, that it's a joke in terms of its scientific credibility, horses, wheat, barley, you know, just all the chariots, steel horses, swords, all the craziness about the Book of Mormon being a preposterous plagiarism. Nobody knows that. Nobody knows the Book of Abraham is a joke in terms of it. It's uh, being a translation from a papyrus. And then a thousand other things. And the reason why, Jim Robinson, the reason why people don't know any of this is because of the walls that the church has put in front, the, the blinders that people have put, the church has put on people's eyes to say, yeah. don't laugh, don't mock, don't talk, don't learn, don't listen, don't, don't mm -hmm. joke about this. Those mm -hmm. are all hooks of control to keep people from seeing the church for what it is. Sorry, that's my answer, that's Mitch. Great. And that's, that's you, something that I'm perfect. Add to that, whatever you want to add. No, I'll just add, a, add, add to that really quickly. Um, I understand because um, I was there and I'm, I know John does too, but I would just like to ask um, what what is disgusting about them? I find it kind of ironic, to be honest, that I post these videos of church leaders being sincere and telling the truth. 
And I get members saying, that's disgusting. You're doing disgusting things these about these men and some of them have passed on and how dare you. And I, I want to ask and go, I have not personally attacked these men. I have not gone, I have not verbally said, this person's a piece of shit or this person's terrible or how they, I'm glad they're dead. No, no, no. All I've done is talk about my, my whole platform is to go, what if church leaders actually told some truth about the history of the church and about their history and wrongdoings? And it's ironic because the comments I get or the people that say, how dare you be so disgusting to these men? It's actually, and some of the most forceful comments have been on the video, my most recent videos of the collage of church leaders talking about apologizing apologizing let's, let's play that let's play that clip now because i've got that is that is that okay yeah yeah because i think it's a really powerful way i don't want to end but i've got a i've got to run in just a few minutes but yeah, before yeah. everyone leaves i want to make an appeal that's really really important not for me but for mitch and for his art so let's show this clip mitch let's have you respond to the clip we'll summarize and then i want to make an appeal to everybody because i think it's super important so let's, Mitch, let's go ahead and show um, your uh, your clip about, about, I think it's about an apology, but let's actually see. But not fully true. My dear beloved brothers and sisters, the time has come for us as leaders of this church to hold ourselves accountable. The Lord and Savior himself would not be pleased with what we have done with such power. Throughout the years, we have misled you, giving you a whitewashed version of what history actually was. And for that, we are terribly sorry. As a part of that narrative, we have misled you into believing things about the prophet Joseph Smith, which may have partly been true, but not fully true. And for that, we take full responsibility. We offer our heartfelt apologies for misleading so many. But please look in your hearts and forgive us as Christ would forgive you. My dear beloved brothers. And so um, that one's so brilliant. And, uh, and I have several people now who are commenting uh, I'll just read a few comments. Laura Lee writes, OMG, this is so good. My friend Allison writes, yep, this is the one that made me weep. Uh, Chris Tolman Hatch says, this one made me cry. Uh, can you tell us what you were going for there, Mitch, and what, what that video was about and, and why you did it? Um, I previously touched on it a bit, but uh, honestly... I, I have often thought to myself, why doesn't the church, these great men that I've idolized to be something which sadly they're not, um, no matter how much I keep trying to think they are, hopefully one day they will be, right now they're not. But I've, I've often thought as many members and ex-members alike, I'm sure, why don't these men do what they should do and apologize? Just apologize and say, we're going to do better. We take full responsibility of this, of the pain we've caused, and we're going to do better. And uh, and so in a way, kind of like Jonathan Streeter, who, who um, shout out to him, he wrote that uh, mock letter, mock apology letter, and he got so much criticism from the Mormons, and uh, but praise because it's therapeutic. It's therapeutic to hear these voices that you grew up with, that you idolize, as truth tellers, as men of, of integrity, and you find out that they're not men of integrity for the most part, it breaks your heart because these are the men and leaders that you, they were your heroes. And, and so part of that, the irony is to go, hey, we're going to apologize. It's healing. And it's, it's funny because it's not going to happen. And those of us who have left know that. <laughs> I've accepted that and God, if it does happen, woo, but 
it's it's not i mean i don't i don't believe it will it, it will destroy their church and that's why they don't do it it'll completely break down their foundation and they'll they won't have as much of a following and, and you know you can connect the dots from there money 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 uh corporation they need members and they know that if they peddle the truth they're going to lose a lot of members and they are losing a lot of members so Beautiful. Well, that's super powerful. I love it. And I'm going to just make an appeal to our listeners. I think this is really important. So this is Mitch's TikTok channel. Uh, the channel name is uh, Genie Man, G-E-N-I-E -E underscore man. So one thing you can do is start following him on TikTok, liking or hearting his videos and commenting on them. If he gets a surge um, of, uh, followers that will definitely help him, uh, with the algorithms. Uh, Derek, Derek Baird actually writes that he says, follow Mitch on TikTok. I work with creators and a surge of followers will really help Mitch. Uh, I also checked out cameo. This is super cool. So I have an idea. Okay. If you want Mitch, you listeners or viewers want Mitch to create, I I'm guessing that cameo is this app that lets you as a, as kind of like a, a celebrity of sorts, maybe give a birthday wish or a birthday greeting in in the name or the character of, of your favorite general authority of choice oh, or figure uh, or celebrity. So Mitch, maybe you need to sign up for Cameo. I should. That's, a, that's an awesome idea. And then you listeners, wouldn't it be fun for your brother, your sister, your spouse, your friend, someone you love, your missionary companion has left the church or whatever, or not, you can hire Mitch to do... Um, you know, uh, you know, a little like a video card for their birthday. I think that'd be, it could be personalized. So that's something that I think, uh, could help. Let's support Mitch in his art. Um, another thing I think Mitch, you can create a Patreon account. And I actually saw someone earlier who said that they would sponsor you, um, with a specific video. So if there's a particular, if any of you want to sort of, um, finance a video of Mitch. Uh, I think uh, the platform that we mentioned earlier provides. Let's see. I'm looking. I'm looking through it. Somebody is saying uh, they're they're making a request for Jay Golden Kimball. Mitch is the best. Uh, Jay <laughs> Golden Kimball next, as suggested oh. previously. Um, Aubrey writes. This is great. When is someone going to make the True Mormon documentary or Joseph Smith movie? You need to act in one of those. So somebody's wanting you to be Joseph Smith. I uh, um, that's honestly one of my dreams. <laughs> is it? Well, tell it us. Is. Tell us how. Uh, I just want. I now that I've left the church, I would love to play Joseph Smith in an actual history historical account. Not because I want to bash him. I already know what he did. It's my. It's it's wanting to understand more. <laughs> and as an actor, you have to dive all in. It would scare the hell out of me, to be honest. But. I would, it would be a good experience to part of to, what's hard is we don't know what Joseph Smith sounded like. That's true. That's so true. it's, it's going to, it's, it's, it's different art because you're not mimicking. You're having to come up with the character, right? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. So uh, others are saying that your videos have been therapeutic. Uh, if someone wants to reach out to you and, in and, and donate to a Patreon or, or just donate to your art. How could they reach out to you, Mitch? Oh, geez, uh, TikTok. You can message me. Um, I'm I'm still catching up on some of the messages, so I apologize if if I haven't responded. Um, Facebook. You can John's tagged me in this. And my, my Facebook is Mitchell Gene Shira, um, and you can message me there. Uh, I'm also on Instagram. I think I'm Mitchell Gene there. Um, but I'll, I'll create a cameo and more platforms and start really chugging away at this because I think uh, there's great opportunities and I feel so humbled right now and, and, uh, honored. Uh, thank you all. Thank, thank you to John for giving me uh, such a nice shout out, um, and to help me in, in my art. So that's, yeah, that's, that's, I'm speechless right now. So thank you. Well, you know, I, I, there's still a lot of Mormon in me. So whenever something has swear words or like is graphic, there's a part of my brain 
it's like, wait, that's too harsh. That's too, but I, I like your idea of challenging that. It's not that I want to become a, a crude or an obscene or a sacrilegious or even a disrespectful person. But, mm -hmm. but I, I, I think you made a really important point that I think I'm repeating now is that we have to look at why, why we have the emotional reactions we do instead of just running, obeying them slavishly in fear, but looking at them and understanding them and, and digging deeper. I think that's what art is about. I think that's what you're doing. And I love it that you're challenging me and others. And so, uh, you know, Mitch Shira, I just want to give you a heartfelt thank you and a shout out. What you're doing is courageous. It's creative. It's funny. I grew up with Rich Little as an impressionist. So I have a, a fun you know, space in my heart for impressions. Hmm. And uh, I love Dana Carvey. You know, I've loved all this, the Saturday Night Live traditions of impressionists. And it's just so fun to have, to have uh, a, a Mormon slash post-Mormon impressionist who's so talented. And I just want your progressive post-Mormon career and your day job career to explode in positive ways. And so Thank let you. today be the, the next step in in the advancement of your career how's that that's awesome thank you so much i i don't know what to, that's a i'm i'm super super stoked super super grateful uh john you've been you've been awesome and and kind to reach out to me and to to uh allow me to share my experience it's been healing i haven't done this i mean personally with others but you know i'll be honest i was i was kind of terrified to get on a platform and share my experience and it's been very healing and i just want you to know that what you do is very healing and therapeutic and you should be proud and and you sir are doing the lord's work <laughs> so keep keep on keeping on I, I love it all right well thank you mitch thanks to all our listeners who joined in and made comments today um so many good comments please stay in touch please follow mitch and of course, I'll just I'll just end by saying again, thank you, Mitch. Thanks to our listeners. Thanks to our supporters. Everyone who who donates to Mormon Stories, the Open Stories Foundation, you make all this possible. So if you donate, thank you. Probably less than one percent of my viewers or listeners actually donate. So if you're one of those that really finds this programming valuable, if you want to see it continue, if you don't want to see it die in the next year or two because of COVID and all the people who've had to stop their donations, please become a donor today. Go to mormonstories.org. Become a monthly subscriber, uh, 10, 20, 100 bucks a month, whatever you can afford. It it pays for the equipment, the software, the production, uh, the time, the effort, all the stuff. Please support us if you can. And last but not least, support Mitch, support Genie Man in all the ways that you can. Thank you so much. Let's have this guy's career flourish. Invite him to your parties, bring him down to the <laughs> I can meet him in person. We'll have you develop like a one act show. Like, I don't know if you know this, but Carolyn Pearson back in the day developed a one man act um, where she would, she would play different characters. Uh, I, I'm going to challenge you to consider developing a one man show where you incorporate uh, general authorities, Joseph Smith, maybe even Jesus into yeah. a one act play that you can tour around Utah and give, and I'll, I'll be your promoter. I will recruit audiences for your one-man show. What do you think? Oh, I think that I think that's an awesome idea, and uh, I'm 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 uh, surprised I didn't think of it. That's actually brilliant. So I'll start to start. That's actually a really really good idea. All right, Mitch. I'll, you stay in touch, and I'll be your number one fan promoter. All right, brother. All right. Hey, thank you, John. I really appreciate it. You've been awesome. You you are awesome. And lots of people want you to develop a John Delin impression. I don't think my voice is very. Um, I don't think my voice is very amenable to impressionists. Oh, but I'll, there, I'll there's the there's the gauntlet. Okay, I'll, I'll give it a shot. No, I'll <laughs> I'll have to I'll have to see if I can do it. There are some voices that that I, I can't do. Unfortunately, they just so. aren't distinctive enough. It's not only I, that; it's just like the creep of their voice and deep and and some kind of something. It's just not possible. But. Oh, right, right. Your profile. Yeah. All right, all right, brother. You take care, listeners. You guys take care. Thank you uh, so much. Thanks for all the support. Thanks to everyone, and we'll see you guys again soon on another episode of Mormon Stories Podcast. Follow Genie Man on TikTok. Thanks, everybody. Take care. Thank you. Thanks, Mitch.